there is an extremely elevated chance of recession. The Fed's got to pray that the labor market quiets down. They're going to go gradually. They're going to watch what's happening in response to what they've already done so far. The catalyst for the next bull market is when the Fed actually starts cutting interest rates. We have more confidence that this rally will continue into December. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on this Payrolls Friday on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK, up on a week in the equity market, yields down on the week as well. Going into this payrolls report, the number we're looking for, 200K. Huge news flow today, and yes, we're focused on jobs, but what we're really focused on is the whisper What's the whisper number? It's lower. Are we going to get cases for the rest of the year? This is weird. There's okay. some gloom out there. Well, we're bonding. We're getting over our anniversary. <laughs> Seriously, folks, there's some gloom out there today on the jobs number. It's in the so-called whisper number. I'm going to model 200s the run rate, and the whisper number is a 150-ish kind of thing. This is the runway into year end. Yeah. We've got payrolls today. <clears throat> then in a couple of weeks' time, we've got CPI on December 13th. Then December 14th, we've got a Fed decision. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo said to me yesterday, Lisa, that he thinks Chairman Powell this week took the teeth out of the CPI report in two weeks. I wonder how important people think the payrolls report is a little bit later this morning. Every data point is going to matter. I just wonder how we know if inflation is coming off quickly enough. We think that we've hit peak inflation. We expect numbers to be weaker. How weak is okay? How weak is enough for the Fed to really take their foot off the pedal in some kind of way that is more meaningful? It's good news, bad news today. Yes. Oh, I don't get You're going to go with that. I'm going to go with that. If, okay. Well, I mean, no, no. If it is good news, bad news, yes. If you get a hotter than expected labor market report, I think that that will be read very good badly. News, by the good news is the, the tree, the bush is being delivered today. 2 p.m. They promised, they promised, 2 p.m., they promised there'd okay. be a squirrel inside. Do you want to know so what happened last night? Come, come he FaceTimed me last night, asked to see my tree, and then... He proceeded to criticize my tree Wait, what? for about an hour. I came in I this morning. That. That's, that's I came in this morning and he's still going. He's still going about my tree. Do you have tree insecurity? He doesn't like do how it's decorated. <laughs> Everyone, he doesn't like the white okay. lights. So clearly, a, the okay, Stewart clearly thing, the therapy didn't work. What's Second the Martha all, Stewart thing? Let's talk about tree. Your update. tree is perfect, John. What's wrong See? with that? Exactly. Nothing. It's just, that's it's John's statement. It's a perfect tree. It's Mine difficult. is you like see Charlie the process Rum. that we go through to decorate the tree. Sure, it's like Tell us about the process. <laughs> discipline. It's like, it's like a military discipline. drill. It's like the Everything's of just sort of equal distribution. Different colored balls. You have like you marching know. music. We have a theme. Exactly. The theme this year is. Tchaikovsky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pearl ball balls, white ball oh, balls, boy. and glass ball balls mixed with, you know, it's good. I'll share it out on Twitter nearer. Near to Christmas. You need two dogs so one can all pee up against the tree. And a squirrel. That's where Just we are. And the squirrel chaos. came out after the third day last year. Equity markets unchanged this morning. Yeah. Let's rip through the price action going into payrolls. Equity futures on the S&P 500 down. Not even a tenth of 1%, Tom. <clears throat> Yields yeah. on the week, TK. I've got to tag it on a two-year. This week, we're down 27 basis points on a two-year yield in America. Disinversion, but the single number yesterday, John, was to see the VIX close under 20 to me is a huge deal. And to me, it was the market front running this jobs report and it, it it's like now 10,000 it's, it's not a big deal that the VIX is 19.80 or it's right now 20.18 but just the symbolism of going from 31 and all that gloom of weeks ago down through 20 to me was a big deal see that in the FX market too Tom yeah. bit more dollar weakness as well Lisa <clears throat> euro dollar 105 handle how much bad news do we need to really be optimistic that the Fed won't necessarily have to move as quickly as they previously expected? At 8.30 a.m. when we get that labor market report, yes, people are having a whisper number that is softer than expected, but how much do wages come down? And we have seen wages roll over just a touch bit, decline 4.7% gain um, year over year uh, on the last monthly reading. How much do we see that continue? And what pace is enough to give people confidence that the Fed can really uh, perhaps not raise as long or as far. Time 45 a.m. One, Jonathan Farrell will be speaking with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. Very curious to hear, first of all, what he has to say about the rail strikes. He was involved in talks with that yesterday, but also just this dynamic between the power of the employee versus the power of the employer. And as a longtime union uh, person, how he would like to see that proceed. And today we do get a host of Fed speak, including Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin and Chicago Fed President uh, Charlie Evans. One of his last events before retiring 
hiring. And we now know that Austin Goolsby of the University of Chicago will be taking over, John. Lisa, thank you. What you making that, Tom? Go Big in the seat. deal. I know, cool. I know Professor Goolsby very, very well. He's a former member of the Milton Academy debate team, among other things. And this is, I put out on Twitter, this is an inspired and controversial choice. Goolsby comes across so kind and so uh, con con uh, convivial, I would say, that you don't understand that he's got first-order monetary chops underneath it. That he's underestimated. He's been underestimated his whole career. I thought it was an inspired choice. Congratulations to him. I'm sure we'll catch Krosner, up. Krosner, we'll talk to about Goulsby. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Greg Battle joins us now, head of U.S. Equity and Derivative Strategy at BNP Paribas. Greg Leiter and I were talking about whether good news is bad news today. What are your thoughts on that? I think in the very short term, it could be. Um, the story for 2022 has very much been one of the Fed and rates driving equity markets. And that's indeed what we could have into the year end. You've highlighted the data points, um, it's payrolls, it's CPI, it's the Fed into year end. But we're looking ahead to 2023, and we think the focus is going to shift away from rates driving equity markets, and it's going to be far more about the real economy and the deceleration and growth next year. With, with, the, with the earnings story, what is your confidence of your earnings calculation for equity markets into next year? In the last 24 hours, I've seen all sorts of people say, sort of, kind of like we think. Do you have a confidence in that statistic? No, I don't. And I don't think anybody else should, too. And that's kind of really the problem that we face next year. So the bottom-up consensus is still for... Uh, mid single digit growth next year. And we think it's far too optimistic. When we look at our kind of macro expectations of where top line revenue could come in, um, we think that's a kind of source of risk. But really, where the rubber hits the road in terms of risk is margins. And it's incredibly difficult to model. And we don't think anyone should have any uh, large confidence in where they, where they see US margins come in. But we think the risks are to the downside and the risks are material. Greg, everyone seems to say this on Wall Street. So who's buying right now? Well, we've seen a lot of money put to work over the last um, two months, and it's been from a kind of collection of sources. So we've seen more than 80 billion of uh, futures bought over the last couple of months. We think at least half of that is hedge funds covering. We've seen systematic strategies such as CTAs put around $25 billion to work over just the last month. And we've also seen signs of discretionary money being put back into back to work. We've seen ETF inflows of more than 60 billion over the last couple of months. So collectively, that's kind of getting on for 175 billion that we think has been uh, injected into the equity market over the last two months. Um, and I think a lot of that is kind of squaring of positions into year end. Um, it's a reduction in this kind of bearishness that we've seen this year, um, less than it is kind of expectations for a more persistent or elongated bull market. So what's the trigger going to be for this capitulation that you expect that usually marks the end of a bear market? So, yeah, I think the, the, the analysis we've done is when we've looked back at all of the crashes, bear markets, recessions over the last 100 years, we have seen that there has been this common, common thread that they do tend to end with capitulation. So capitulation is a move associated with a sense of panic, a rebasing of expectations, analyst aggressively cutting forecasts and volatility spiking. Um, we haven't really seen that yet. It's been an environment where we've had more of a grind lower than equ in equities than an explosive move. Tom was talking about the VIX back at the 20 level. It's kind of indicative of a much more benign environment. Analysts haven't slashed those earnings forecasts next exactly. year. Exactly. Um, we're looking to kind of Q4 earnings season that kind of kicks off in the middle of January. That is a potential catalyst to shift from Fed and monetary policy to the growth outlook, corporates and margins. Uh, Greg Bottle, the same question I asked Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley yesterday. Are we going to misunderestimate earnings because we misunderestimate revenue growth due to nominal GDP being sprightly? Is that is that the the singular equity risk as we misjudge the top line? I personally don't think so. I think that the top line being driven by nominal rather than real growth, I think, is well understood. I think more uncertainty lies in terms of the margin forecast. The idea that margins can be resilient next year in an environment where we see a real slowdown in terms of growth and this kind of uh, policy tightening that's already been reflected by a kind of compression in valuations, but hasn't hit the real economy. The idea that that's going to come without margin pressure, I think, is a test. So less focused on top line, more focused on what is the outlook for margins, how deep could the margin compression be? And that's what we think drives earnings. Relative trade question here, Greg, just to wrap things up. Europe or the US, the Eurostox 50 has had such a monster rally off the lows at the end of September, up around about 20%. Which one have you got a little bit more confidence in? 
out of the frying pan and into the fire, I'm afraid, John. I think neither is, is the answer for us here. We're looking for a correction in both into the next year. Uh, the rally that we've seen in Europe has been absolutely massive, given the still eco difficult economic backdrop. Um, you look to the US as a relative safe haven, but the valuations offer you no support there. So we're not bottom, bottom fishing in either market as yet. Great to catch up, Greg, as always. Great battle there of BNP Paribas going into the weekend and payrolls Friday just around the corner. <clears throat> European equities have had a massive run, and that's also down to China and this reopening story. This headline just crossed the Bloomberg that the 2023 Formula One Grand Prix in China will not take place due to COVID-19. Now, Tom, the 2023 calendar, F1 not taking place. Can you read between the lines there? Can you extrapolate that out to a broader story, do you think? Well, I, I don't know about that. I thought Leland Miller was great and the other, uh, Wei Li and the other conversations we've had on uh, China. I'm going to go back to Ed Bastian of Delta Airlines on this show 18 months ago. Said, Tom, international, China, forget about 23. He was dead on. And are we out to 24 now? Are we starting to crystal ball gaze into what do we do in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Chengdu, and the rest? Chengdu is important for a lot of businesses. We're out to 24 before we even make it to 23. <clears throat> Formula One saying this, Lisa, ongoing difficulties presented by the COVID-19 situation. That doesn't speak to the enthusiasm and confidence people have around the reopening story in China at the moment. And this confirms what everyone's been saying, that the enthusiasm that people have been having about the reopening story in China hasn't been borne out by facts. And this just sort of speaks to that story. On the other side, international events cannot take place if they don't have any conviction of what that policy will be. And it's clear that that is not uh, currently available. Very different here in America. We had a state dinner. I believe, Tom. Look but at this list. Was there. Tim Cook, I Brian Moynihan, Dior, I'm not sure. Bernard Arnault, yeah. Patrick Puyan of Total. I, I went through the list. Christian yeah. Louboutin. Yeah. Mr. Colbert was there. There you go. And, you know, I a big senators, fan. gathered senators. They all got around and coughed worthies. on each other. That's good. They should do I mean, it more often. That, the contrast. I don't know. How, how many We should do more of this. Is, we should oh, do more state been, dinners. We should have been that's your take coverage. Away. Yeah. Oh, we should have been there. <laughs> we should have been That's your ultimate conclusion, you know, that we should have been invited. We should have been out there on the lawn. It's always Oh, my gosh. Yeah, exactly. She's wearing her mask. Oh, boy. Oh, you want to do that? Like yeah, one of, of those Vogue uh, things? Oh, yeah. yeah like Met Gala-esque surveillance. How are you feeling, Senator, this evening? Can you tell us who dressed you? AMH is joining us in a couple of minutes' time. My dog. What are you wearing? This is Bloomberg. Anne-Marie's like, oh, I got to... Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Traders are waiting today's U.S. jobs report to see if it provides any clues on the Federal Reserve's next move. The job market is starting to cool off, but the report may fall short of the turning point Fed officials are seeking in their battle to beat back inflation. The median estimate says the economy created 200,000 jobs in November. The Pentagon it reportedly is considering a major expansion for training for Ukraine's armed forces. According to The Washington Post, the plan has been discussed for weeks by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and other top U.S. military officials. It could lead thousands of Ukrainian troops to be trained by U.S. forces at a base in Germany. Economists say China's top leaders are likely to signal a more pragmatic approach toward COVID controls at an upcoming meeting. They're also expected to put more focus on boosting economic growth. The 24-member Politburo usually meets in early December to set broad outlines for economic policy. Beijing has been signaling a, deci a decisive shift away from its COVID-0 policy. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. to speak with Mr. Putin if, in fact, there is an interest in him deciding he's looking for a way to end the war. He hasn't done that yet. If that's the case, in consultation with my French and my NATO friends, I'll be happy to sit down with Putin to see what he wants, has in mind. The President of the United States, alongside the French leader yesterday, going into a state dinner. We'll pick up on that in just a moment. Going into payrolls about two hours away. The state of play in the equity market looks a little something like this. Up on a week, on a session, pretty flat. Down about a tenth of 1% on S&P 500 futures. <clears throat> Ten-year yields lower on the week. Two-year yields down by 
27 basis points on the week so far. Pretty phenomenal move lower off the back of Chairman Powell. We'll get to that in a moment. Euro dollar, more dollar weakness. Euro dollar right now, 105. 35. We have got to talk about unions just briefly, Tom. Yes. The President of the United States said this back in 2021 on Labor Day. He said he intended to be, quote, the most pro-union president leading the most pro-union administration been. in been. American history. If you don't support the right to strike, can you proceed to make that claim, Tom? This is a this is steeped in the history of America, and basically they have reduxed 1877 1946, right after World War II, and there was a period in my youth where the same thing happened. The bottom line is there is a tradition of government intervention sure. with the rails, and we had at this time, much like previous auto strikes, where the the rail laborers, union members, don't agree with their union management. They voted the Senate, the House, the President has stepped up for union management, not the rank and file. Here's the question, Tom. What leverage do the workers have if they don't have the power don't know. to I walk away? I do not away? know the answer to that. And what does this mean for future negotiations <clears throat> and this administration's role in them? I, I, I don't know, and I think it lends importance. We're going to do a Jobs Day interview uh, with John Farrow with the former mayor of Boston, Martin Walsh, who started out in Dorchester and Southie in union management. And I'm going to guess his Jobs Day really doesn't matter with the secretary today. It's about... He's going to have union. a lot to say on this, sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, looking forward to it. I think about 9.45 Eastern time. There were unions last night represented at a state dinner as well. Let's do that with Amory Horton right now, and we'll get to the serious stuff at hand. I love the theme here, Bon Nouvelle, that that that, that you've got going, Lisa. You know, good news, bad news, Bon Nouvelle et Mauvais Nouvelle. I don't know what it was last night, but she was there. Oscar de la Renta at Belmain for years and Amory Horton uh, with Pierre Belmain last night. What was the dinner like? Was it a success? Let's start with that. Would, would Mrs. Onassis, would Mrs. Kennedy have been happy? Listen, I was not at the dinner for, let's just, Tom is just joking here. I was not at the dinner. Obviously, I've read all the reports out of it, spoke to some people who were inside. It does seem like it was a success. It was on the heels of what I would say also was a very friendly press conference which I did attend between Emmanuel Macron and President Biden, where going into this trip, Macron, you know, gave an interview with the U.S. network broadcaster and really came out kind of fiery and punchy about the Inflation Reduction Act and the subsidies and what he would call an unfair advantage for American companies. And it does seem like they walked a lot of that back. The tone was brought down at that right. press conference. It does look like these two want to work together. At moments, it was almost like a... Bro, bromance, I think you could yeah. call it. Well, it's like um, John and me. Say, you know, I can see, I yeah. can, you know, it's the same thing. <laughs> Amory, very importantly here, this is serious now, about the rail strike. In the last 24 hours, the body language is, is labor lost. Did the rail workers l lose yesterday? In some senses, they do, but we should note that the majority of these rank and file members did vote for that tentative agreement that the administration was able to broker in September. This also came up yesterday in that press conference with the president. He was asked about this and he clearly was annoyed because the question was to the president, are you saying that uh, members of labor unions do not deserve paid sick leave? And he said, I negotiated a deal no one else would be able to negotiate. And what his point was, I've been working every day since I began this administration and I campaigned on paid sick leave, not for all, uh, not just for the labor unions, but for all Americans. And also he, he made a quip that was, you know, quite embarrassing for him to even have to be fighting for this and talking about this in front of a European leader where this is obviously just the way things are in Europe. You get paid sick leave, you get maternity leave. Uh, and the likes. So at this moment, it, it, we knew this was going to be tricky for the president because he's in, he wants to be the most pro-labor leader. Many would say he has been in modern times, but at the same time, he had to look out for the entire economy and really force Congress to act. Well, Anne-Marie, let's blend the two stories. The French leader is very unhappy about the Inflation Reduction Act. Within that act, you can get tax credits on EVs that are domestically made. The French leader would like those tax credits to also apply to EVs made in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, Anne-Marie, can you walk me through the current stance of this president? And where's Congress on this as well? How are they responding to the complaints from the Europeans? 
Well, Congress passed legislation. Do you know how difficult it would be, especially with the Republicans will be taking the House, the majority, next year, for Congress to go back and rewrite legislation so that the Europeans would have a, a same advantage as the Americans? What U.S. officials will constantly say is that there's just not enough investment in this space period. So if U.S. companies are benefiting, do something maybe that European companies would benefit on your own home turf. At the moment right now, what the president said yesterday in the press conference was he never wanted to leave folks behind that were not cooperating with the United States, a la France, Germany, etc. But at the same time, he said maybe there are tweaks going forward. There is a task force. Macron in that uh, press conference said that they want to synchronize and have their teams cooperate and look for investments. But at the end of the day, it remains to be seen how this would actually work because it is legislation, and I do not see that being rewritten. AMH, down in DC, thank you. Wonderful work. We'll catch up with you in the next hour. Lisa, I don't think anyone wants to go back over that in the United States, and the complaints from the Europeans are just going to keep on coming through. How do they then come to some sort of agreement on some of these other bigger issues, whether it's China, whether it's uh, other types of dealing with Russia? You're right. I don't think people are going to want to do that in the U.S. How do you muddle through? This is a muddle through president who's trying to come up with practical responses, even if they go against the ideals. How does he do that in this particular case? Can I switch gears to a Wall Street issue? Do you ever ask permission I'm to do asking, that? Yeah. Usually, I'm usually to, just, look, you know, in like, the therapy just we did gears. yesterday, John, I'm trying to be more sensitive and more vulnerable. Can I switch gears? Of course you can. Blackstone, this is not a small issue. I okay, the gating. Clear, Walk this, us through this. This is not Credit Suisse. I want to say that from the first. And Blackstone was heated to the FT yesterday. They're giving substantial returns of 9%-ish uh, in their returns. Sri Natarajan and Don Lim at Bloomberg moved the story forward. And basically, Asian investors in their real estate fund want to take their money out for whatever reason, and they buttressed up against those limits. This is stock down 8%. It was not a small issue. You know what the question that's being asked, right? Right. Summer of 07. Yeah. And the funds, well, was it BMP? V Vince no, we, we Vince doing that kind Reiner of thing again? brought this up yesterday. He's like liquidity out there, 2023. Yeah, it's not a small issue. We'll breathe some life into the story through the morning. Was that okay? How that, that was beautiful. Thanks for asking for That's permission. That's it for the day. That's a new thing. <laughs>
linked to the inflation report before the Fed meeting. Is it delusional to think the Fed can get out front and make a guesstimate, or do they just simply have to wait for the data? Well, I do think that they are going to be data dependent, continuing to look at the data closely, but they can get out in front a little bit more by looking forward. And what I mean by that is we're starting to see signs of incipient labor market weakness in an array of forward looking indicators. For example, the four week average on first time jobless claims is moving up again, and it's well off the lows of the year. If we hold at current levels by next spring, we'd actually have a recession signal out of that data. The conference board released some confidence numbers this week, and within that index, um, there's a measure of households that say jobs are plentiful, leading indicator, that's been rolling over. The quits rate has been coming down, albeit from high levels. And so we're getting more data now that's suggesting the labor market is losing steam, uh, but that's the intent of the Fed. So this is what they want, and I think this is what they're going to get. What is our history of seeing and predicting a recession? The last 12 months, I suggest, many have been off the mark in their gloom. Can we actually get out front of a recession, or do we just simply have to wait for NBER to tell us it's here? Yeah, well, NBER, you know, they they will confirm, but they don't. Uh, they're not in the business of making forecasts, so it'll already be obvious that it's going on by the time they make that call. Um, this year was confusing because we got two down GDP quarters, and a lot of people thought that that meant there was a recession. But the NBER came out and said, actually, that's not how we do it. <laughs> so we had strong jobs growth. We had a falling unemployment rate into the summer, and so those things have never been associated with a you know with an actual recession. If we're thinking about 2023, where you have the unemployment rate rise. Uh, start to rise, that's a totally different animal. And there is a lot of talk about recession now. That doesn't mean it isn't going to happen. I think the risk is actually quite elevated. Uh, your team there has done a great job covering the yield curve inversion that's been going on this year, and it's recently broadened pretty dramatically. I think even now the Fed's measure of the near-term forward spread is pretty significantly inverted. And that is probably the best forward-looking signal of an impending recession that we have. The problem is, if you look back in history, um, the lags vary pretty significantly. So there'll, there'll be no way to time it precisely. Or what all our clients ask is, tell me the exact depth and duration of the next recession and when it starts. And you know, I, I wish I could do that, um, but you know, it's it's really guesswork. So, Michael, you expect inflation to keep going down. Do you still believe in transitory, or is this a different nature of a decline in inflation? <laughs> yeah, I do think headline inflation is going to come off the boil uh, pretty rapidly as we move into the middle of next year. But unfortunately for team transitory, I don't think that is going to uh, bail them out. So that that phrase was used back in 2021 to mean that inflation was really non-monetary, that it would probably only last a few months, when in fact uh, the inflation was the result of the Fed going into a hyper-accommodative monetary stance, and then at least initially uh, being dilatory and starting to reverse course. So the inflation intensified and broadened. But I think the Fed is caught up now, and we just were talking about the yield curve. I think you could even argue that they're in a somewhat restrictive stance. So growth will slow, inflation will will roll over with a lag, and and that's where we are. So it's not going to it's not going to bail out team transitory. But this new argument now, team I'm calling it team structural. I think that's going to turn out to be <laughs> okay. That, that rebranding does not work. I'm sorry, but nice try, uh, Michael. I, I'll give it to you because it's your birthday. You're talking about how the Fed might already be restrictive, and that's not consensus at all. And that's what you're not seeing in, in terms of the market. If the Fed backs away or even just doesn't raise rates as much, you get a rip roaring rally as people pile back into risk assets. Does that concern you, or does this seem consistent with your view of the path of the economy and the path of inflation? Yeah, that's a good question. The Fed is worried about uh, so-called financial conditions loosening up. And so if they signal a step down in the pace of hikes and 
interest rates pull back and equities move up. That's not necessarily what they want. But I think the Fed has you know, put itself in a box here if, it, if it's simply going to be responding to equity market moves. It really depends on what's happening to inflation expectations at the same time. And if we look out the curve on inflation expectations at the 10-year horizon, we're you know, in the 230s. Um, because those are based on the CPI and not the PCE deflator, and the CPI runs 20 to 50 basis points higher on average, you could argue those are mandate consistent levels. And so if the Fed is stepping down the pace or starting to reverse course on, on policy mm -hmm. and those inflation expectations really rise materially, then the Fed should pay attention to that and respond. But it can't just be a stock market story, in my opinion. Michael, if we look quintiles, one-fifths or deciles, one-tenth of the labor force that we see at 830 today in the two reports, are we aggregated? Can you look at the holistic view of the American labor economy? Or out of this pandemic, are we so fractured, fragmented, polarized that it's different labor models at, at hand? Is, can we aggregate or not? Yeah, I think we can aggregate. I mean, obviously, we had a lot of distortions in the labor market and other parts of the economy from the pandemic. Um, and it does look like we've had some early retirements that may not be coming back. But this this labor market has, for all practical purposes, fully recovered. It's very tight, uh, but it is losing steam at the margin. And I would just say to the viewers, watch the unemployment rate. It is coincident to slightly lagging, but it's probably the best single summary variable that will tell us when a recession is ongoing. And it's not going to predict a recession. We need the yield curve and other forward-looking measures for that. But if the unemployment rate levitates half a percentage point or more from year earlier levels, and that's you know basically going to be 4% uh, or a little bit more, uh, that would be a really strong sign that the U.S. economy is either on the cusp of a recession or a few months into a downturn. It's never happened in history. I think it came up in a discussion earlier today on Bloomberg. You know, could the unemployment rate rise a percent or a percentage in a point and a half and stop? Never happened in post-war history. Anytime we've gone up half a percentage point from year earlier levels, we continue to rise in a recessionary fashion. And in the in the smallest increase post-recession trough to you know recession peak or, or sorry, pre-recession trough to post-recession peak has been about 220 basis points. The median is just over 300 basis points. So a mini recession is possible, but you know, you're really arguing against the historical track record. Hey Mike, happy birthday from Team Surveillance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Michael Dowder there of MKM. Just want to draw your attention to Credit Suisse. Session highs in Swiss trading. The stock is up by 7.5%, coming off the back of a record 13-day losing streak. Francine Lacqua catching up with the Credit Suisse chairman a little bit earlier this morning, Tom. And the chairman told Francine that the Swiss lender had seen withdrawals basically stop. So have the outflows stopped at Credit Suisse? Yeah, I, 13 days down a row. I mean, it's been brutal. Been Still got a two hand. Up, I have real trouble with a 7% move. In fact, maybe it's walking from the bid over to the ask, you know, away from the actual published uh, number. The answer is it bounced a little bit at a grim level near that dilutive calculation when they do, go out and was it four gajillion they're doing? Lisa, they're hoping we've seen <clears> the bulk <throat> of the bleeding through October and November. Well, Let's go to directly say. to his Sure, I'm words. with you. I'm with you. When Go I on. speak to clients, I already know that there are going to be inflows. You know, on one hand, he has to calm the markets. On the other, the specificity of this, if it is not proven in the data coming up, that's going to be another story that he's <clears> going to have to face off with. This is more concrete, which is the reason why shares are responding. The Credit Suisse right now up 7.7%, but still trading with a two-handle. <laughs> It's Swiss trade. Hey, That's the key. It's pretty ugly stuff. Coming up, Diana Amoa, CIO for Long Buyer Strategies at Kirkus World Capital Partners. Looking forward to that conversation. Been a while since we caught up with Diana. Yes. It's payrolls Friday. 200K <clears throat> is the estimate. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Kremlin says Vladimir Putin will continue military operations in Ukraine, but it adds he's open for negotiations. A Putin spokesman was responding to President Biden's remarks that he would meet with Russia's president, but only if Putin indicated he was looking for a way to end the war.
In South Africa, leaders of the country's ruling party are meeting today. While the fate of President Cyril Ramaphosa is up in the air, he's said to have considered resigning after an advisory panel found he may have violated the Constitution. The panel investigated Ramaphosa's alleged failure to properly report a robbery at his game farm. In the wake of the collapse of FTX, former FDIC chair Sheila Baer says U.S. regulators have enough power to oversee cryptocurrencies. And she said is a crackdown is needed so banks know where they stand. If a business is legal, then to tell a bank not to do, not to have dealings with them, I think is hard. And I am unaware that any of the entities doing business with U.S. banks were, were illegal. So. I think it's hard. It's, it's, it's a very controversial issue to try to use banks to shut, insured banks to shut all of this down. U.S. authorities have now ramped up their investigation of FTX and are asking those who use the exchange for information. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I see uh, the, our, act, our actions actually having some impact that would, uh, that would lower the rate of inflation. I think that um, my expectation would be that we would have a, a slightly higher rate yes. than I had anticipated in September. Michelle Bowman of the Federal Reserve. More Fed speak still to come a little bit later. I believe you hear from Barkin and Evans, and then it's done. It's the quiet period. It begins tomorrow. I know many of you are happy about that, going into the Fed decision on December 14th. Before we get to the 14th, we've got a payrolls report a little bit later this morning, and then we've got CPI on December 13th. Going into all of that, equity futures on the S&P down a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields unchanged on a 10-year. That classic kind of payrolls feel, Tom, ahead of the number. 350 <clears throat> 98, we're going nowhere. Euro dollar going nowhere. 105.30, crude going nowhere. $81.25. Yeah, we had a lot of interest this morning in Maria Tadeo with Spain losing yesterday. I can report that she's being monitored in Brussels and is improving. <laughs> We've seen that. You know, she said to me last hours. night, Maria WhatsApp me last night and she said that Spain <clears throat> chose to lose deliberately so they could get into the weaker half of the draw. Did and she avoid say that? Argentina. They sandbag the. That they, is the official stance of Maria Tadeo. The well, Spain lost deliberately. It was critical there for a moment, but she's improving, and you know we're planned. thrilled to bring in that today. It was being mm. monitored as we speak. What you need to know, folks, we're going to let John bring this up because what you don't see when we're on commercial break, and I, I wish we do like you could see us talking and all that, and then show the message. And we thank our great supporters of Bloomberg Surveillance every day. But it's one nonstop World Cup talk. Continuing our World Cup discussion, Diana Omoa joins us now, hugely qualified in the equity market. But, John, pick it up with Diana about the path England has from Senegal to France and beyond. It's a tough path now because they've got Spain. Do they have the toughest the path of anyone? Uh, they've got to get past France, Spain. If they progress and those teams progress, and then ultimately it could be Brazil or Argentina in the final. But given how things have gone so far, I've got no idea. And I imagine Diana has no idea either. Mm. Diana Ramoa, the CEO of Long Vice <laughs> Strategies at Kirkus World Capital Partners. Diana, a proper introduction for you because you deserve one. Can you walk us through this market, Diana? Because I keep hearing from a lot of people who expect this earnings weakness to punish equities in Q1 of 23. You're on the same side of things with those guys. I think it certainly deserves a little bit of um, consideration as we go into the year, particularly given the rally we've had the last two months. Um, I'd say markets were probably better positioned for um, for the weaker data that we had a couple of months ago. I think the short squeeze that we've seen as a result maybe speaks that positioning was extended. While the U.S. data has been slowing down, um, it's not slowing down fast enough, I think, to justify some of the bearishness we had in the extreme. That said, going forward into 2023, I think the outlook might be somewhat more challenging um, from the U.S. perspective. We're already seeing signs 
that there is an element of consumption that's starting to slow down somewhat um, in the US. And additionally, I think given where we are from a valuation perspective, it's a less attractive market to be owning um, if the concerns around earnings slow down, slowing down more aggressively into next year uh, actually plays out. I still don't understand this, Diana. Everyone who comes on says that it's going to be okay for a couple more weeks, and then we're going to see the earnings per share, and everyone's going to sell, and it's going to be terrible. We're dead on. This is a forecasting yeah. instrument. It is a forward-looking instrument, the S&P. The people who are trading should be looking forward. If everyone's seeing the same thing, why are the prices not reflecting it? A hundred percent. I think it's um, you can usually call the direction right or the timing. It's very rare that you have people getting both the timing and the direction right. And whilst there's a lot of um, there's a lot of concern around earnings, justifiably so, whilst everyone is talking about it, in my experience, it seldom plays out um, timing wise. So there is a chance that this ends up being one of the most frustrating bear market rallies we've seen because the timing doesn't quite play out as people expect, i.e., come Q1 next year, we may not necessarily see the kind of price action markets are discussing. Um, and that might take longer to play out. I'm watching the 10-year yield, though, and this has been really the one consensus trade that has done well. I'm looking at yields about 3.5%, down about 70 basis points from a recent peak. As recently as just a couple of weeks ago, I'm just trying to understand how much further this can go if everyone's on the same side of the trade and equities aren't, aren't buying into the same story. So that's the disconnect we have right now, because we've had this aggressive inversion of the yield curve that's um, that's playing out, as we've seen, the 10-year has come off quite aggressively off the highs. So the bond markets are saying we're heading into a recession. Now, typically, that tends to happen um, between 18 to 24 months of curve inversion. So what we're really saying, if you go by what the bond market is telling us, is a recession is more of a second half of next year trade um, rather than a first half. And I think equity markets are hoping that between now and then you will get a real Fed pivot, i.e. not slowing down hikes from 75 to 50, but actually the Fed saying we've stopped hiking now. We're mindful that the economy is slowing down perhaps faster than we'd anticipated. <clears throat> and if indeed that plays out, we will actually start to ease. I think that's unlikely, but it feels the equity markets are really much more poised for a pivot than the bond markets. Hey, Diana, if we get inflation sustaining at a certain given level, which gives us some form of decent nominal GDP. Can that save equities? Can that save revenue growth, revenue persistency, and cash flow persistency? I think it could help. Um, it could help. But ultimately, um, if you have high inflation that's supporting nominal growth, but the labor market is starting to show signs of weakness, I think markets will react to that. Because at the end of the day, it's really the consumer that's been keeping the economy ticking along. Yes, business balance sheets are much more resilient than they've been. And I think COVID did help to that extent in terms of getting companies to think about refinancing and also getting rid of some of the weaker balance sheets um, that had been in the market. But if you start to see labor weakness, which is why I think the data today is going to be quite key, I think that could be um, much more meaningful and impactful for sentiment. Dana, what do you think is the most important number today? Is it the headline number or is it wages? Uh, I, Without a doubt, I'd say wages. Um, the headline number has been somewhat noisy. If you recall, last month we had that um, higher than expected print, which people are still trying to grapple with um, on what was coming through in that data. There are some inconsistencies in some of the subcomponents. I think the earnings is probably what markets will be watching for. Uh, for signs that we are starting to see some ease in the labor markets, that um, the labor markets inflationary pressures are not becoming entrenched. And that's something the Fed has said is a big focus for them. So they don't want to see the second round wage spiral. Diana, it has been too long. Don't leave it so long next time. Diana Ramo there of Cocos mm -hmm. World Capital Partners. Wonderful to catch up as always. Next hour, fantastic lineup. Priya Misra of TD coming up in about five minutes time. Then after that, Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley will catch up with Ellen Tom at around 7.30 Eastern time. Did you see Feroli of J.P. Morgan in at 150, published 150 survey? Sure. There's a real, Went through the numbers there, this morning, There's a yeah. whole group of people south of Ellen Zetner. I believe she's at 180. Is Do you want the full range? Can, the oh, full range, the highest 270, up, yeah. the highest 270, 270, the low 60. Yes, you 60. do. Yes, you do. Okay.
Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm with Diana. I'm looking at wage dynamics seriously. And You're I think not alone. Lisa, Lisa's been great on labor participation. I'm in the camp, Lisa. Labor participation is a fiction because of demographics and social policy. The world of Austin Goolsby, we don't have a clue what the labor participation is. But if it doesn't change, that means people aren't coming back, and that was sort of the uh, best case scenario for the Fed. It's a disincentive to retirees to unretire and work with Pharaoh. I mean, you know, that's what... Do. What are you suggesting? Therapy is definitely not working. What are you suggesting? Mm. I don't know what I'm suggesting. Mm. Don't talk to me like that. <laughs> <laughs> there is an extremely elevated chance of recession. The Fed's got to pray that the labor market quiets down. They're going to go gradually. They're going to watch what's happening in response to what they've already done so far. The catalyst for the next bull market is when the Fed actually starts cutting interest rates. We have more confidence that this rally will continue into December. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is Payrolls Friday, 90 minutes away, live from New York City. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, good morning to you. It's Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK, the number we're looking for today, 200K. We're having, a light, we're having a light Friday about it, but this is serious stuff because all of a sudden, as we heard from Michael Darda, the data is getting a little nudgy here. There's a little tension in this. Not, I, I'm sorry, I'm in the camp CPI in a, in a couple days here is more important, but nevertheless, the tension's there this morning. What have we had so far? ADP? Wasn't impressive, was it? Manufacturing a little softer, a whole lot softer, in fact. Looking at the ISM yesterday, Quits the employment rate, component jolts, of the ISM, Lisa, you know. not great. You wonder if this starts to show up in the data a little bit later. It also points to the political pressure next year. We haven't even seen the unemployment rate rise. We're seeing a little bit of softening from the mm -hmm. highest levels in 40 years for inflation. And all of a sudden, people are saying the Fed needs to stop. Yeah. They're going to crash the economy. I mean, just to talk about a little bit, the shift in tone really highlights right. the conundrum next year for the Fed. And I asked Darda, do you aggregate this morning at 830 or is it about different parts of America? John Edwards of Louisiana's two or three or four Americas. I'm not aggregating. I think there's some people out there, John, in real pain. The move has started in the bond market. <clears throat> on a 10-year, and now the two-year. The last time we had payrolls Friday, about 20 minutes after the number came out, we were pushing okay. 480 on a two-year. We're back down to 420 with a big move this week after Chairman Powell. Both of you follow this much more than I do. Is anyone out there framing a 330 or 320 10-year yield? Yes. I would say no one. Are, is, are there people modeling recession-like rates that much forward? Brian Weinstein of Morgan Stanley. He said that he expects the 10 year yield to go down to three and a quarter percent by the first See quarter of she next says year. That, John, she says it, but she cuts. Tom, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, you See missed the conversation with Brian earlier this week. You took the day it's, it's, it's off. Bad. I know. Yeah, I got some time. Uh, well, at least it's pretty brutal sometimes <laughs> if you've missed stuff. She expects you to be up to speed on interviews you haven't seen. We had to clear the living room for the tree. <laughs> so, do I go to therapy time. next time too? Just so <laughs> everybody, with everybody, just so you understand, at Bloomberg here and the Bloomberg family, no one tops Scarlet Foo. I mean, Scarlet Foo's tree. When it Foo's comes to tree, the tree, she's out there. Level. She's like north, not to Albany, but she's north somewhere. And the ceiling is like 30 feet tall. Oh, she's I mean, doing like the, the 15 like, foot thing. You, it wouldn't fit in the White House. It wouldn't be there. Oh, she's past 15 feet. Well, like 20 feet. Yeah, they got a crane and everything. Well, they do it outdoors. Yeah. Equity oh, futures look like this on the S&P 500 going into payrolls, 8.30 <clears> Eastern time. And our survey moving target, of course, going into the number. But the median estimate so far is 200,000. Equity futures are down a couple of tenths of 1%. We are down on the session. We are up on the week in the equity market. Yields at the moment up on a session, <clears> down on the week on a two-year. Tom, I keep going back to this on a two-year right now. Yeah. Down on the week by more than 20 basis points after Chairman Powell. And we disinvert from negative 80 gloom and all that to negative 75-ish and now negative 69 on the two-ten spread. Less inversion than what we saw in the gloom of a week or so ago. And John, the real yield. Are you doing the real yield this afternoon? I'm not, no. You can't. Brazil's playing. I know. I'm you busy, watching, I'm busy watching football. The real yield is a stunning 1.14%. Can you imagine the 10-year real yield under a positive one the two wow. tens back in a way, Lisa. The two year versus the ten year, negative 68 basis points this morning. Is the data bad enough to uh, really give people a sense that this is warranted? 8:30 a.m. We get the labor market report for the month of November. How much do we get a sense of the hourly average wages coming down rapidly? How much is enough to really give people and that transitory uh, crew, which have not gone away, just to be very clear, some steam? And that is what I'm going to be watching. 9:45 a.m. Very curious to hear this conversation, John. You're going to be speaking with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh talking a lot about I'm sure the rail strike 
How does he talk about their support of unions from this administration, plus a mandate from this Congress that they get on with it and pass a bill that the union would not ratify? A real tension underpinning, uh, I'm sure, what you're going to do a wonderful job talking about today. And we get a host of Fed speak, the last Fed speak before the quiet period. Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin and Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans, one of his last addresses before he retires in January, taking over Austin Goolsby of the University of Chicago, who has a bit more of a hawkish tilt, John. It's sort of interesting if you look at some of his uh, proclamations and readings uh, ahead of time. Going to be an interesting voting voice on the Federal Reserve. Sometimes the seat can change you when you get in there, Tom, and you sit around I the table. Strongly the seat agree can with change that. you. you. Become a public visible officer. It's going to be interesting to see how the seat changes. might change him. Well, Professor Goolsby, it'll, it'll be interesting. We'll talk about that with Mr. Krosner. We're gifted to have Krosner with us today. Priya Misra joins us right now, the global head of rate <clears throat> strategy at TD Securities, as, as we like to say, Tom, the queen. She's of interest killed rates. It. Let's just, just she's fantastic killed it this year. This year, but the trades have come off, Priya. So you went long the ten year at four twenty five. You took that trade off at three seventy. <clears throat> you put the flattener on looking for deep, deep inversion, negative forty, fifty, sixty. We went further. That's off too. Priya, what's left? So I have to say I'm very nimble in terms of trades right now. I mean, it's, you know, I have the direction of still lower rates. It's just we've come so far so quickly. I think the market's misinterpreted the Fed a little bit. Um, I think the recession is our base case. That's going to mean more cuts will happen in 24. That means that the 10-year, our forecast for the 10-year at the end of next year is three and a quarter. But we've moved really fast. So, you know, I think you have to be nimble in this market that's not very mm-hmm. liquid, that's extremely volatile. I think you have to trade in a nimble fashion, I will look to go long again. If we sell off a little bit, we realize that the Fed uh, will be forced to keep hiking. We think the terminal rate right. is going to be higher than uh, than where the market's pricing it in right now. So I think I'm trading it in a nimble fashion. It's the timing versus direction. But the direction, I think, is still lower rates. And unfortunately, a Fed that's going to be forced to keep hiking because inflation is going to be really sticky. And Priya, it's surveillance. We always, always listen to our guests who get it wrong and get it right. The hardest thing is to get it right two years in a row. I think of Ellen Zettner, who will join us later at Morgan Stanley, has nailed that. Nick Benenbrook at Wells Fargo and Foreign Exchange. And now you. The call that you're going to make for next year Are you going to get the suddenness of it as we got with inversion? Is it stochastic? Is it pointy where, boom, we disinvert? So I think that's the key question. You know, at what point do you put on steepness? Do you start betting on Fed rate cuts? And that's the question I keep getting from clients. I think not yet. I mean, it's all going to come down to inflation is going to decline, and that's in our base case. How quickly is it going to decline? And does it get sticky at 3%, 3.5%? And we don't think the Fed can start to ease if inflation is at 3 or 3.5%. So I think you stick with that. Uh, inversion trade. The inversion will last much longer than what we're used to. The economy is going to slow down. We're all going to look at the Fed to ease. And I think they're going to stand pat, as as they're telling us. They want to be restrictive for a while. So I think the time for the steepener is much later in the year, when inflation has you know, sufficiently come down, you know, at least two handles somewhere before the Fed can start to cut. So I think you just trade the flattener when it steepens a little bit, you put on the flattener as opposed to really talking about disinversion, I think actually requires the Fed to start to ease. And the labor market is still very tight. That's what we're looking for today. But watch wages. I think actually that's more important than the headline number. That's what is going to drive core services inflation lower if wages start to come off. And I think it's still too early for wages to come off. Given that that is actually a popular belief among many people. Do you think that the 10-year yields and the rally that we've seen, frankly, across Treasuries this month has been a bit overdone? I think the speed of it I do struggle a little bit with. I mean, you know, we thought more cuts should be priced into 24. We went from 100 basis points of cuts to almost 200 in a short Mm -hmm. period of time. I think the market's pricing in recession. I actually think that's right. I mean, I expected that to happen as we got much weaker data. It's happened faster, so it can actually now stabilize here. What I struggle with is the easing in financial conditions or this idea that the Fed can stop at 4.8 on the terminal rate. You know, if inflation is going to be sticky, I think the Fed hikes 15 
you know, in, in two weeks' time. Then they hike another 50. Then they continue to hike, maybe at a slower pace. It's the end point of the hiking cycle. I think the market's a little optimistic. I think Chair Powell didn't push back against the easing in financial conditions. I think that's what the market took relief in. So the front end, front end rates, I think, can rise. That can pull the 10-year a little bit higher, which is why I took off the long. But longer term, I think the, the, the recession is sort of, you know, I think it's baked in the cake at this point. Just want to dig into that a little bit more, Priya. If you believe the recession is baked into the cake and you think maybe we're still underestimating how far this can go, let's use this morning as a case study. Let's say we get an upside surprise on payrolls. And I think we all understand where the two years going to go in that world, yields higher. Priya, why do you think that you push that out through the curve, out to tens yields up, and not push it out through the curve and think, you know what, the Fed's going to go harder, I'm going to get that recession that I'm expecting yields lower. What is it that makes you think you push two-year yields higher out through the curve and yields up off the back of a payroll surprise? I think if you get a strong number and strong wages, it's going to imply that the Fed has to hike more. And then I think people look at, you know, how much can they cut? If inflation is high or wages are high, that's going to constrain the Fed's ability to ease. And now we're pricing in almost 200 basis points of cuts between, you know, mid-23 and mid-25. I think that's going to, people are going to struggle to price in more cuts. If inflation is high, the Fed is going to be constrained in terms of how much they can cut, which is why I think that inversion stays constant. And if the front end sells off, I think the 10-year the also sells off. It's only when inflation starts to come off. And that's why you see the last CPI report, more cuts got priced in because people realize that the Fed is has a dual mandate. They're elevating inflation right now. But, you know, if, if growth starts to weaken and inflation is still high, they're going to be in a real tough bind and they may not be able to cut as much. So it's really this pricing in of easing. At 100, I was pounding the table saying more cuts can get priced in. At 200, it starts to look a little tougher for them to keep easing. Priya, thoughtful stuff, as always. And I think we've said it a million times this year, but congratulations on just some phenomenal calls through 2022. Priya Misra there of TD <clears> going <throat> into payrolls. Payrolls, Tom, one hour, 20 minutes away. They amend along the way. This is something I think the financial media really gets wrong. We want to look at a single point estimate and go, you were successful, you failed. Baloney. It's how you amend along the way. She had an aggressive call and then amended it beautifully. Taking those trades off. And Marie coming up later in DC in about five minutes' time. Do you know who's not? Maria Tadeo took the day off, Tom. No, but, but took the but day we'll off do it after the break. Spain lost. But, you know, really terse comments from her. She's resting planned. comfortably. Because Spain at lost. They did it yeah. on purpose. Sent She's me, resting Sent us an email moments ago. Maria had a long planned day off today. Do you like how she did that? Maria. Yeah. From Maria. Yeah. <laughs> And did a full debrief with Ferro yesterday on WhatsApp. First half good, second half bad, but strategically better for Spain. No Brazil, no Argentina in the knockout. She didn't ask that. me for a debrief. Beyond that, no comment. I want a debrief. Lisa <laughs> wants a debrief. What are we? We Enjoy don't get the, today, yeah. the official <laughs> breakdown from today over there. AMH coming up next from Washington. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Pentagon reportedly is considering a major expansion in training for Ukraine's armed forces. According to the Washington Post, the plan has been discussed for weeks by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and other top U.S. military officials. It could lead thousands of Ukrainian troops to be trained by U.S. forces at a base in Germany. Traders are awaiting today's U.S. jobs report to see if it provides any clues on the Federal Reserve's next move. The job market is starting to cool off, but the report may fall short of the turning point Fed officials are seeking in their battle to beat back inflation. The medium estimate says the economy created 200,000 jobs in November. Shares of Credit Suisse have rebounded from record lows. Chairman Axel Lehman told Bloomberg the bank has mostly stemmed the huge outflow of client assets, which surged to about 90 billion earlier this quarter. The outflows basically have stopped. What we saw is two, three weeks in October, boom. And since then, flattening out, they have stopped. It's gradually coming back, in particular in Switzerland. Great. Credit Suisse is pitching investors on a capital raise it needs to finance a major overhaul. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
This inflation is being caused because of unbelievable wasteful spending in this government. We have got to start saying to ourselves, we're at $31 trillion worth of debt. How, when do we stop? Is 35 too much? Is 40 too much? 45 too much? We've got to put a brick, we've got to be a brick wall to this government spending at some point. And that is Rick Scott of Florida. He is the Republican senator, and that is the story that you see in Washington. There is a different story, and it's not the joy of a state, depart uh, a state dinner last night that we saw, John. It's still this growing tension between the president of the United States and Mr. Putin uh, in this war in Ukraine. Interesting that the president is open to having some kind of talks, and we're hearing from Putin this morning through it was Dmitry buried Peskov. In the, news. the Kremlin spokesperson yeah. saying this morning, Tom, quote, Putin was and remains open for contacts for negotiations. Of course, the best way to achieve our interests would be through peaceful diplomatic means. Now, it's not the first time we've heard this kind of talk, Tom, but certainly this aligned with what we heard from yesterday. I think we'd all like to hear much more of it. We need an update, and we do that with someone who was in uh, Vladivostok, whatever it was, on the west coast, the Pacific coast of Russia years ago. Amory Horton joins us now with her Putin experience. Amory, we haven't talked about the this in east. ages. This is in the Far East. The Far East, yeah, whatever. My map failed there. You know, I played Risk. That's the only reason I know the map. Amory, long ago and far away, Mr. Putin had power. Has his power changed just over the last 90 days? Oh, I think incredibly his power has diminished on the international stage for sure. You even see the likes of Xi Jinping of China. I think, you know, the statements coming out of the G20 from the White House readout of that meeting with Joe Biden, you you obviously <clears throat> saw the Chinese sending more signals that they're right. a little bit uncomfortable and clearly unhappy with what President Putin is doing. Internally, though, it remains to be seen, right? Because he still is able to uh, have control of Russia. But what you do see internally from Russia, Russia, and, and even I've witnessed, is a mass exodus. It is a brain drain of right. um, numbers of people, those that are highly educated, and also young working men who do not want to go fight this war. And this is something that is going to uh, inflict a lot of pain on their economy over the next 6 to 12 months. Bring it back domestically to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Scott or the governor of Florida, Mr. DeSantis, and their battles within the Republican Party, or Mr. Biden's Democrats, do they support the president in visiting with Putin or speaking to him? Well, it remains to be seen. We don't exactly know what their uh, feelings are about that specific comment, but I would say the president caged it pretty well. He said, I have no imminent immediate plans to speak to President Putin. And he said he only would if Putin was serious about ending this war. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone in Washington who doesn't want Russia's invasion of Ukraine to end. Does it indicate, though, in Anne-Marie, a greater uh, frustration with this dragging on conflict and a greater desire to get to some sort of end and perhaps move away from some of the arms supplying and other uh, rhetoric that has seemed to amp it up in recent months? Yeah, and also you have uh, Mr. McCarthy, who's going to be the next speaker, likely talking about the fact that it's not going to be a blank check going to Ukraine. They want a little bit more oversight. Republicans, and also we saw that letter from progressives that was just honestly kind of weird because they walked it back after they sent out this letter. There is, though, what the president said yesterday, another way to look at this. He was standing next to Emmanuel Macron, who is going to be speaking to President Putin in the coming days. It's on the heels of this morning, a call between Olaf Scholz, the chancellor of Germany, and President Putin. They had a call this morning, discussed a number of things. Putin, of course, airing his grievances of the West sending weapons and training Ukrainians, but also they discussed the very critical grain deal that the world is relying on, especially the most vulnerable economies, as well as potentially fertilizer coming out of Russia. So the president was in this moment where his allies that he's trying to keep together as a united front are engaging with Putin. I'm, and that's where he made this comment. So I'm glad that you brought up the grain shipments. And I want to go to the oil shipments as well. I was confused by this this morning. OPEC slashing oil output by the most since 2020 seems like it would be a real bullish thing for oil prices because it's reducing some of the supplies. But oil prices are up because Russia's output and the amount that's going to come back online next year could offset that. Can you explain this? Basically, is the world getting back engaged with Russia in a sort of stealth way? Well, Russia is still sending 
Listen, the lifeblood of Putin's economy is still working, right? He is still sending out natural gas and oil. And what the West is doing is also creating a space for him to do that. There was a sanctions package from Europe that basically said you, Russia will not be able to ship crude oil anymore because it is going to sanction those companies that are largely European, Malta, Cypriot, Greece. These are where these ships come from. And now they're working on this oil price cap. It will come into play on Monday. The likely threshold that we are hearing is $60 a a barrel. Right now, euros are trading, and this isn't the only grade Russia has. They have other grades that usually fend for higher numbers, but right now, euros are trading at $52 a barrel, which means that Putin is still going to be able to ship his cargoes within this limit and still make the money he needs to make. I still do not understand this price cap. Thank you. I, 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 do I not, don't understand I, the I'm policy. Not, I've heard someone try and explain it to me I, five different times. I can't even read about it. I, when I read about it, my eyes glaze over. I, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't no, get I, it at all. Do you get it? It has to do with ensuring uh, the barrels and sort of the key mechanism to get ships to actually be able to transport this oil and be able to do it without getting sanctioned. And so they're trying to come up with a mechanism to do that. They take Russian oil, they move it to country X, and then they call it country X oil, right? That's exactly what's happening. That's what we've seen all year, right? I think. Well, but the irony here is... But but this is the irony, right? Prices have gone up because people think that Russian barrels have gone off market, but they haven't. They've just gone to India, been refined, and then sent it to Germany. I mean, this is sort of this uh, irony in the whole situation. Sure, what we know. Bizarre. AMH down in D.C., Amory, always fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. The focus on Washington a little bit later on how the Federal Reserve will respond to some of these numbers in the next <clears> couple of weeks. Payroll's coming out in about an hour and five minutes from now. The estimate is 200,000. The previous read was 261. Though you ask guests in a moment, Tom, what do they want to see? Payrolls or wages? I think up front right now, they take that wage figure. Um, I, I agree with Diana Moore totally on that. It's about wages as well. There's some interesting research notes this morning. Ben Emmons goes the other way from the whisper number and says, what are we going to do if it's 210 or 220 or 230? How's the market going to react? It's a very smart Where's note. wages in that? Where are wages in that? And what does it mean for this Federal don't, Reserve when they sit around the table together in the middle of December? Still got a lot to go through before we get to the end of the year. We've got payrolls out in about an hour and five minutes. And then you've got the CPI report on December 13th. And then the Federal Reserve decision December 14th. And I'll throw out the ECB as well, December 15th. Yeah. And then take the rest of the year off, right, Lisa? That's how it works. Does the, e- does the so. ECB really matter? <laughs> Not for me. I'm going to leave after the 14th. <laughs> just playing around. Future's down a tenth of 1% from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. It is Payrolls Friday on Bloomberg Surveillance. Payroll 60 minutes away in the United States of America. Going into the big print, we look a little something like this in the equity market. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Slightly negative through most of this morning. We're down by not even a tenth of 1%. Negative 0.04%. The Nasdaq 100 down a tenth of 1% also. Down on the day, <coughs> up on the week. Similar move in the bond market. Yields right now, twos, tens and thirty, shaping up as follows. Unchanged on the day, but down aggressively on the week. On a 10-year, much more so on a two-year time. We're down three basis points today on a two-year. Year, down more than 20 on the week so far. We're sub 420 on a two-year. We never know with the standard error, the mistake that can be made in payrolls, what the news is. But let's say we get the whisper number. The downside what surprise. We'll move? Like if we're not 200, we're 170, we're 150. Whatever the number is, what in the market will unravel? To me, it's fascinating given the two months we've had in the equity I'm going to suggest it would endorse the move we've seen so far this week already. It will endorse what we've already seen with the VIX through 20. Based on what we heard from Chairman Powell earlier this week, Lisa, and the way we responded to Chairman Powell on Wednesday. It depends on the wages, though, as well, and sure, the hours worked. And I think that people are going to be looking beneath that headline number because it has been yeah. so noisy and so messy. I looked carefully two days ago at the inflation-adjusted wages. There's a number of ways to look at this. And, and all I can say is the level and duration of the 
negative real wage is, is jaw-dropping for so many Americans. There's a big question as well about what the actual hiring will be, and I want to take a look at some of the companies that are in the areas that are struggling the most. Marvel Technology is a, a chip maker and put out some negative earnings, negative outlook. You could see the shares going down pretty dramatically, down five, more than 5 percent ahead of the open. Open door. Right? This is flipping houses, not exactly the place that you want to be going into, and they've uh, just lost another member of the executive team, and they are struggling as well. Those shares lower even still, I mean, look at that. They're dollar eighty-one. It's not like they're coming down from a pretty high place, going uh, with losses of about two point seven percent in Blackstone. I want to pick up on what both of you were talking about. The story overnight uh, about uh, withdrawals uh, from their one hundred twenty-five billion dollar <clears throat> real estate investment fund, the BREIT, that they seem to exceed the quarterly limit. So they gated it or they restricted some of the outflows, with, yeah. which really suggests the souring uh, type of sentiment around commercial real estate and how quickly global right. money is moving. This is really important because commercial real estate has a duration of debt that's not 30-year mortgage or whatever. I don't even know what commercial real estate does in London, John. Here, it's like a seven-year rule. So when commercial real estate booms, boom, it booms and you, you get your money out. Or if it falls apart, it, it, like that, gone. Well, to be clear here, they're saying this is not about the performance of the fund, right? The fund is, they, they're, they're heated to the financial they're plans yesterday. They're saying it's not about the performance they of the fund. They got it wrong. We're making 9% to our customers. This is not a Credit Suisse kind of event. But clearly, TK, as you've pointed out, there's <clears throat> liquidity issues with these kind of funds. Just by definition. Uh, is Just by definition. Yes, absolutely. And the beast of commercial real estate and all the REIT challenges over the last 40, 50 years. But to partition this, there's a notoriety of Mr. Schwartzman's company, John Gray's company, with residential real estate nationwide. Are they buying up Kansas City so you can't get a home? versus commercial real estate, which is more that seven-year duration. Well, this really does speak uh, to a liquidity problem, uh, essentially and fundamentally, because if, com if, if, if big investors are getting <clears throat> worried and they can't withdraw from funds that are protected against having fire sales, how much does that in create an even greater aversion for going into some of these funds that really right. don't prop up some of the valuations longer right. term? Let's get a brief here, and we'll get a brief here on job economy, 20, uh, 57 minutes away, if my math is right. He has better math than me. My Michael McKee joins our Bloomberg Economics and Policy correspondent. What is a distinctive feature in 55 minutes, Michael McKee? What matters? Uh, I think Lisa gets the prize today. Uh, basically, she noted the average hourly earnings is going to be important. And that's uh, really what's going to matter to the Fed. Yeah, on Wednesday, Jay Powell came out and divided inflation into three categories. One was uh, rents, one was goods, and one was services. And he notes that rent prices are coming down, not reflected in the data, but the Fed knows what's happening there. Goods prices have uh, backed off some, but it's services prices that are still contributing to inflation because they can't can't find workers, and so they're bidding up wages to try to bring them into the labor market. And so if that starts to slow, then the Fed will be happy. I don't think it's going to change much as far as the December 14th meeting, but uh, a move in the right direction would be helpful. Are we done with a Federal Reserve that's going to push back against financial conditions easing? I, you, you have to wonder if they think it's even worthwhile anymore. I went back and looked at a bunch of charts this morning, and financial conditions started easing. At the same time, uh, the stock market started to go up and bond yields started to go down, which was the day that we got the September CPI report, which was stronger than necessary. And you would have said on that day, mm -hmm. well, it's a recession scenario. And then we got the October report which everybody said was, oh, soft landing, but it didn't change the trajectory of any of the markets, and it didn't change the uh, financial conditions indexes. So you wonder if the Fed is going to say, w financial conditions are still pretty tight, they've come <clears throat> down some, right. and we can't jawbone these people anymore. Mike McKee, Jim Glass from the J.P. Morgan has been absolutely brilliant about saying the gloom of labor is off the mark. He reaffirmed that yesterday with Paul Sweeney and uh, myself. What does small business say across the nation? Uh, small businesses are in the, sort of the same position. They've scaled back their hiring plans a little bit, but uh, still a big plurality of them say they can't find people to take jobs. And that's the problem for big companies and little companies. There's still more than 10 million job openings. And... Uh, 
about 6 million hires, according to the JOLTS report last month. So there's 4 million jobs going begging somewhere. Uh, obviously, there's skills mismatches. But as Powell suggested on Wednesday, uh, it, finally coming around to the idea that the participation rate won't matter much anymore because he doesn't think people are coming back in. Uh, Interesting. Ex excessive retirements, uh, excessive mortality due to COVID, <clears throat> and the labor market is just going to be uh, weaker going forward. The number of people who want jobs, not enough to fill all the jobs out there. Mike McKee, we're lucky to have you. We're going to catch up with lucky you a little bit later. Screen. Going into payrolls and coming out the other side. Mike McKee there. This from Drew Madison, MetLife. And I'm pleased we've got Alan Zenner and Morgan Stanley with us, Tom, because I'd love Alan's thoughts on this. Drew says decisions to provide raises lag. This is why annual increases take time to show in paychecks. Hours are set week by week. He thinks wages that today yeah. are less important than hours worked. If you had tremendous difficulty hiring, do you fire first or reduce yeah. hours? That's called Maury Harris 101 at UBS when young Drew Mattis worked for Dr. Harris. It's an it's interesting take, isn't work. it? Yeah. Well, they, they, they like Ellen Zentner, uh, Drew Mattis was on a team that won every award out there and trying to figure the game out. We are thrilled to bring you Ellen Zentner of Morgan Stanley. Um, I want to go to how you became regarded on Wall Street, which is your measurement of the American consumer. How is the American consumer? It was been waiting, the gloom, the recession. Do we all agree we see a boom still with the American consumer? What's the state of the American consumer this jobs day? So I think the state of the consumer is better at this point in the cycle uh, than we've ever seen, and mostly because of balance sheets and because of job gains. But it's not equal across the income distribution. Uh, we saw that lower income households earlier this year had got, moved through and, and spent through the excess savings that they had. So that was what was helping them uh, deal with higher inflation. Uh, but wage gains uh, continue to be strong. Uh, and as long as we're creating jobs and the wealthier households are spending, then you're going to see aggregate consumption uh, remain pretty resilient. There's a big disconnect then in people who are heralding the end of peak inflation and a move away from that, and people who are still seeing the resilience. And there's a real uh, sort of mismatch in how Jay Powell is discussing this as well. Does he seem to still believe in transitory, and is he basically giving a nod to that? Uh, no, I think we've, we've shut the door on transitory, and I think future chairs will probably be uh, less apt to use that, that term. Um, but he it has shown a lot more confidence uh, of late. I mean, this was really a surprise this week when he spoke at Brookings of just how confident he was that inflation will come down. And that was a big shift for him from needing to see it to, to, in the data to I'm pretty confident it's going to come down. What do we have to see today in the labor market and in the upcoming prints with CPI and heading into next year to confirm your call that the rate that the Fed could start cutting rates as soon as December of next year, even as they say, we're not going to do it, we're not going to do it. Yeah, so I think we're going to have to see continued softening, um, right? So jobs, it's 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 a great day for economists because we love dismal, uh, dismal <clears throat> data. And, uh, you know, I'm out here heralding. Why are you please. looking at me on dismal data? Look at Lisa. <laughs> You've got no. the map of dismal uh, on your face, Tom. No, so, yes, Lisa gives me Bruce more optimism. Bruce, killing it. <laughs> if someone tells that Lisa Steve gives you Roach more optimism. never say that to me. Yeah, but we want softer jobs. We want softer jobs. We want softer inflation. On a month-over-month -month basis, we want okay. to see that progression. You turned on a dime. I don't know when it was. John, you're better at this than I am. I'm going to say February. You were all transitory, and you just came out and said, Boom. I'm wrong. What's the thing right now that could be your new transitory where you say, boom, I'm wrong? What, what's the attribute within the Morgan Stanley team? Uh, well, I think, you know, last year uh, when we came out with our year ahead outlooks, our big call was that inventory building was going to be huge this year. And that was going to create a lot of downward pressure on inflation. And it just didn't come through. And we admitted that early in the year, moved yes, away from that call, which is very important to do. Um, but we could end up, it could end up being just timing, right? Because now we're seeing the inventory to sales ratios are not that out of whack. There doesn't need to be a lot of inventory building that happens outside of certain sectors. Uh, but if we're wrong <clears throat> and you do eventually get that broad inventory building where there's overbuilding, then we're going to miss to the downside on inflation next year. I, I, I look at this, and again, the word I use is rule. James from Australia just emailed in and said, make another good call, Ellen. 
Uh, that would be James Gorman. I, I, I want you to summarize the mystery for you as you try to make an outlook. Pharaoh here says all outlooks should start March 31. <laughs> I mean, that's a solution to the silliness that we go through with outlooks. Not Morgan Stanley's necessarily, just to be clear here. No, I love I just the think way it takes I've said three this three months, times this week. three months to like figure out what dogs. you're going to be wrong is about. Is that because but, first quarter is sort of... I think usually it takes us about so, three months yeah. to find out yeah, how bad the consensus all wrong, was. He's saying. <laughs> Around the fractious, I mean, Steve Galbraith invented this with Steve Roach and all that. It's fra Dick Burner. It's fractious. What are you guys screaming about off payrolls, off inflation to the Fed meeting that frames your year ahead outlook? What's the distinction you're arguing about? So the distinction uh, to us is that one, the the Fed does not need to hike until they get down to their two percent goal. Um, but that uh, they do need to hold rates steady high for a time. And we were pushing this before more monetary policymakers were jumping on board with this. Uh, it's something that investors are still trying to grasp, oh, but I, haven't you, fully you grasped. Because we got to talk about this 2% thing. Yeah, well, yeah. I think that, um, look, there was <clears throat> reason for a lot of optimism after Powell spoke this week at Brookings. I'm not sure I agree with how much optimism creeped into markets after that, because real rates are going to continue to rise. They're going to rise throughout next year. Um, and basic 101 on equities is, I don't think equities like higher real rates. Uh, and I don't think that that's been realized yet. And we're lucky you're going to stay with us for another segment. Alexander She's gloomier than Mike Wilson. Are you calling Not Ellen possible. gloomy? No. She just said real rates are going to go Ma Mike the Wilson, roof pretty the stock market's going to go to 10 Mike's pretty bullish into year end. He is. It flipped. Into year end. Into yeah. year end. Are you and then things get bad for the first quarter. Yes, of course. <laughs> with with Mike Wilson? Yes. Oh, okay. Because we're Are not you trying to cause terms? trouble at Morgan Stanley? <laughs> know, whatever. I'll get him in here. We'd love to have both of you in together. I'll right. sit. I'll, I'll go take a break, and you can talk. You know, with the desk the way it do we, is. Do a year end thing. Do a year end. We Mike can find Wilson, another spot at the Ellen? end of the desk. March fifteenth. I'll sit in the timeout chair. Do there. the March fifteenth yeah. look ahead thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the next hour, eight thirty Eastern time, when you get that jobs report, Mike McKee's going to break it down. Then we'll hear from Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock. Looking forward to that. In the hour after that. In the 9 o'clock hour, we've got Rick Reader for you from BlackRock. Mohammed al Arian's going to weigh in on all of this as well. You catch up with Secretary Walsh. We'll get Mike Collins of PGM and Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital. Quite a lineup in the 9 o'clock hour. Very railroad. Have you ever owned the four railroads in Monopoly? Did you own the four, all four railroads? No, I, I used to I always used to, yes. end, I used to aim for Park Lane and, and in, you know, in boardwalk the, and the big that. ones. Payroll's 42 minutes away, going into it. Equity and futures, a mystery. slightly negative, 0.05%. We've got an estimate, Thomas, about 200K. 200K is the median estimate in our survey. Going into this one, a big focus, Tom, on things like wages and what this will mean for Chairman Powell and the committee <clears> on the December path. 14th. And, and we're on the break here, you were talking with Alan Zentner. And, and to be clear here, do we know where Mr. Powell's terminal rate is in his head? I don't think we do. Well, we're expecting a step up in a the summary up. of economic projections from the September projections to something maybe yeah. with a five-handle, Tom, for next year. Wonderful guests coming up. Stay with us on radio and television through this important report. Jeffrey Rosenberg will be with us at BlackRock and Governor Krosner with the Booth School on Austin Goolsby as well as this jobs report. Right now, as we had Priya Miser earlier with her curve inversion call, the terminal rate call of the year was at Bloomberg, our chief U.S. economist. Anna Wong was out front with a stunning call. Yes, I laughed her out of the room. Yes, I was wrong. Anna Wong, do you reaffirm the territory of 5% is a terminal rate? Right. I, so our call has remained unchanged. We still think that 5%, which the upper end being 5%, is the terminal rate. Anna, do you think that the market's gotten ahead of the deceleration and inflation that we're looking at? Well, you know, I, I was going back and looking at forecasts in the 70s. And one thing interesting I noticed is that when inflation was climbing, the Fed and the markets were all, all uh, underestimating inflation. And when inflation does come down, the Fed and the market um, underestimate the the rate of deceleration of inflation. So, given all the de uh, you know deflationary forces we are seeing in the world, uh, such as in China and uh, inventory destocking in the U.S., I do think that the case for a strong pace of disinflation next year is quite plausible. Oh, Anna, I've got to rip up the script. I'm so sorry. One more question. 
The microeconomist Austin Goolsby is going to prosecute monetary policy out of Chicago, out of Booth. How will Mr. Goolsby do? A modest uproar in economics this morning. Well, um, from from the things that I've heard um, Goosby talk about, uh, I think he uh, he does perceive that supply factors played a key role in monetary policy. I think he's going to bring the debate onto the FOMC table and challenges Powell on the view that the Fed needs to do a lot on the demand side to bring inflation down. There is going to be a debate next year, and there will be growing divisions in the FOMC. Oh, you see how diplomatic she hey, is? That debate's happening right it's now. It's going to be like the British. Anna Wonka Bloomberg, thank you. Yeah. Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley, lucky to have Ellen still with us. Ellen, do you think that breakdown in the consensus on the committee is playing out before our eyes in the statement in the news conference? Is it getting harder for this chairman to go out there and communicate a consensus that might not exist at the Federal Reserve? No, actually, I disagree. I think there's a strong consensus on the Fed. I think that we tend to hear from the loudest people <clears throat> Um, who aren't necessarily in the center. I, I won't ask you who. Uh, and we have to be vigilant in paying attention to what Powell in the center is saying, right? And they've been very clear that it has been a consensus of 45 to 5% peak rate, um, that that has probably moved up somewhat, as he said, uh, and that they're going to have to hold it there for some extended period of time. That's a pretty strong view on the Fed. And it's given a lot of near-term certainty on monetary policy that wasn't there. And if you ever wanted the counterfactual of how much monetary policy uncertainty was weighing on markets, just look at what equities did on Wednesday when Chair Powell spoke. In markets, we like to make things really simple. We throw around a single word, pivot. There's a lot more meaning behind that word for you. It's a three-part story. Can you walk us through why you break this down into three parts? Yeah, it's a bit more nuanced. I mean, the, to me, the first pivot is when do they start stepping down the pace or communicating that they're going to start to step down the pace of rate increases. So that communication has happened, and so we've seen the reaction and anticipation of that pivot. The next pivot is when do they stop hiking? We think they stop hiking at 4.625%, so that's the midpoint of the range. So 475 for the, the peak rate in January. Um, depending on the data, it could stretch out longer for that, and maybe you do get two of five, maybe even five and a quarter. Uh, but that is the second pivot, is when do they stop hiking? And then the second third pivot, pivot is when do they start cutting? Uh, and we've not gotten real communication yet on when do they stop hiking. They think they know where the peak rate will be, but that's going to be the next pivot that gets market reaction. How have we moved so quickly from an expectation of five to five and a quarter uh, percent Fed funds rate in terms of their peak rate next year to what you're looking for, a 4.6 percent rate, this first pivot engaged with already at the Fed? So we've been very um, resolute that they would get to January and that they would get to a 475 peak rate. Um, that's the top end of the of the range. Um, we've seen the market make these wild swings around that number, coming down to, if you round it, 4.8 percent, up to four, five and a quarter percent, bouncing around because the Fed is data dependent. And as each data point came in, that was occurring. And it got up to five and a quarter percent. And then what did we get? We got the first downward surprise on inflation in October. And since then, uh, there's been a, a real consolidation in the view of what the Fed will do. Mm -hmm. And the Fed has been much more clear on what they think that they will do. So I think, at least for the near term, that volatility around where could the peak be has probably been diminished quite a bit. You mentioned one pivot. Then I think I heard two pivots at the table. Let's go to the triple pivot now, the hat trick of pivots. And that is Olivier Blanchard writing a la his colleague Adam Posen at Peterson Institute that when we come down, it is more efficacious to stop at a 3 percentish because of the word salience, which is out of VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. Are we are we going out to where there's a new level that is the new 2% if it's 2.8 or 3.2% or whatever? So this is an interesting debate because we have, as, as Lisa said, we have our first cut coming in December 2023. The Fed still thinks that it will first start cutting in 2024. We have that in December 2023 because that's when, in our forecast, core PCE inflation break just breaks below 3% because... 
I like to point back to opportunistic disinflation, which was which was a, a, a Wilcox paper um, in 95, 96 about the Fed does not need to hike again all the way back to where they get to 2 percent inflation. You can set it on a downward trend. Be sure you're headed there. All the elements are in place and the next downturn can do the rest of the job for mm -hmm. you. So you need some cushion there. And I think a cushion of one percentage point is perfectly appropriate. Got 30 seconds on a clock. 8.30 Eastern time. What's the number for you and the team? 180. 180. Yeah. I'm looking, I'll be happy if we're just lower than the prior month. Let's just keep the softening continuing. TK? Physics with Ellen. I think it's great. There's, a lot, of, there's a lot of dynamics there yeah. going on. I, I have huge trouble, John, getting out with the certitude of Ms. Zentner of getting out to the end of 23 or that. I can't even get out to the end of January. So you've got to get the downshift, the step down from 75 to 50. I had a double pit. Then the pause. Is that what I heard? And then the third piece of it is the cuts. And they've got the cuts out in 24. And um, Wall Street's got that further I've never heard this whole in. pivot thing in one. It's like V-shaped, you know, way back 07. Hey, V-shape was Double good fun, pivot, wasn't it? Double pivot, triple pivot, Thank whatever. you, Ellen. It so sounds like ice skating. <laughs> so <I> just, <laughs> Thank you. Know, you. Good for, thanks for the physics lesson. Future's down about a tenth of 1%. Payroll's <clears> 35 <throat> minutes away from New York City for our audience worldwide on this Payrolls Friday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Do I believe inflation is off its peak? Absolutely. We're in an environment where inflation is not going back to zero. The Kool-Aid is the gloom and doom. This rally will go further and it will probably drag people back into thinking that the bear market is over. That post-pandemic distortion is probably going to last for some time. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Yes, a jobs day, but so much more in the coming hours. Huge news flow out of Washington, but everyone focused on the state of the American uh, labor economy. John, you're going to talk to Secretary Walsh labor the, uh, later. The state of labor is the jobs report, and on to, in America, a possible strike. Maybe, maybe not. It's taken off the table. Should unions have the right to strike? Does this administration believe that? If you believe you are the most pro-union president, pro-union administration in the history of the United States, are you still, after the decision to impose this deal on workers through Congress, can you still make that claim? In all the turmoil that we see, particularly in the United Kingdom on this as well, and it comes down to wages, and wages is the focus here that we have in 29 minutes. For most of the streets, Tom, the, the jobs report. without a doubt, away from the headlines number, it comes <clears> down to wages. And what does it mean for this Federal Reserve Ahead of that Fed meeting on December 14th, we've still got CPI before that. We heard from Chairman Powell, and that's really the main mm -hmm. event so far this week. And he took a lot of weight out of the front end of the curve. The two-year yield right. is down by more than 20 basis points this week alone. Off the back of Chairman Powell largely, as it looks like he's shifting the emphasis away, Tom, from overcooking it. And that was certainly the communication we got from him in the news conference. And I think there's been more than just a subtle well, shift in the last couple of weeks. The subtle shift, Ellen Zentner down to 180,000. I believe Michael Ferroli at JP Morgan down to 150,000. What does the spread market say, Lisa, about the R word, not the R starred, R starred, starred recession? People are staying away from high yield or not going in as much as investment grade, but still you've seen spreads come in. There is a bigger issue here when you start talking about the move you see in rates, when you start talking about the more optimism that you're seeing in equity markets, which is a stealth cutback. Is it really the headline number or is it wages? Is it, is it hours worked, as Drew Mattis right. said? Is it companies that aren't doing the same kinds of hiring plans as they have previously? And how much are people really hearing about that behind the I said other news flow this morning here. And, of course, part of this is year-end with the rationalization of the markets in chaos, the economics, which we're covering today, over to finance, over to investment. And then, John... Over to suddenly, Catherine Burton, who's been legendary in hedge fund reporting, reports that without Ray Dalio, let's be clear, this is not Ray Dalio, but his Bridgewater has had a really tough couple of weeks. So Catherine Burton's written up the story, Tom, so I'll stay true to the story and read it out for everyone who hasn't seen it just yet. Bridgewater Associates erased most of its returns. It notched through the <clears> year's <throat> first three quarters, running what was shaping up to be the hedge fund giant's best right. annual performance in more than a decade. The story goes on to say the Pure Alpha Fund tumbled 13.2% in the fourth quarter through November 25th, cutting its year-to-date gain to 6%. From 22. According to people yeah. familiar with the matter. Yeah, I mean, from 22 to 6, you th I, I would suggest we're going to see a lot more of this. 
So what's I mean, that? Have, have you got caught short there? As the equity market oh, rips, what do you think is behind wanna, that? I don't want to speculate on that, and Burton doesn't have that in the story. But you, you, I think the volatility that we have, and it's not just VIX, Lisa. It's the move, you know, the yield curve volatility, and that what we've seen in FX as well. I wouldn't, you know, I'd love to talk to Rebecca Patterson this morning at Bridgewater, but yeah, good luck to anyone trying to be, be a macro. Available. Good luck to anyone trying to be a macro strategist right now. Yeah. The, the the winds shift so quickly, right. and they don't necessarily cohere with exactly the economic projection. Data: The VIX through 19 uh, through 20 closing at a 19 level yesterday, 20.29. Quick, John. Data. Equity futures right now going into this print, totally unchanged on the S&P 500. No drama whatsoever. 26 minutes away from the payroll report. Yields basically unchanged as well. Your 10-year Tom, 351 euro dollar. A little bit of a stronger euro in the mix. Weaker dollar for sure over the last month. Euro dollar right now, 105.35. Chinese yuan, a critical support. It's already happened so quickly here. A stronger yuan is something to look for into their Monday morning, our Sunday evening. Nadia Lovell now on this job day, senior U.S. equity strategy just at UBS. Nadia, everybody's looking a whisper number down lower. If we go the other way and we get 200,000 or a higher number, what does your equity space do? I think it's going to be challenging for equities. But, you know, what we're really also focused on is not only the job numbers, but also the wage growth, because Chairman Powell has made it very clear that non housing services, inflation is a key point of concern. And so we need to see that wage growth come down closer to something that can get to the pace of three and a half percent, that that would be more consistent with the Fed getting to that two percent inflation target. And so at 830, that's what we're watching very closely because we don't want right. to end up in a sort of a wage growth spiral. How is, you know, I, I want to I want to channel Mr. Colbert last night after he attended the state dinner at the White House. Stephen Colbert would call it growthiness. How does growthiness look into 2023? You know, as we look into 2023, we do expect that the economy is going to slow. I mean, we're looking for a mild to shallow recession by the time we get to mid-2023. We're also looking for an earnings recession. We don't think that the consensus is appreciating the contraction that's going to happen in 2023. We think that there's going to be at least another 10 percent reduction to the consensus forward earnings estimates, more closer to in line to our 4 uh, percent contraction for 2023. Even that might be a bit optimistic. A lot is going to depend on how shallow and how deep and how long that recession might be in 2023. It's amazing to see how many strategists on Wall Street right now are basically calling for a flat market over the next 12 months, I Nadia. Agree, You're at 4K year-end 2023 on the S&P. Can you walk us through, Nadia, the path, what the path to 4K on the other side actually looks like, what you think it will look like? It, it won't remain flat. I think what's going to happen, what we're expecting is that we're going to see another pullback in this market. You know, it would be unusual for a bear market to bottom ahead of a recession. We just haven't seen that before. And so we think as we get into 2023, the market is going to really shift away its attention from Fed's action to the economic reaction. And as I said, we're expecting a mild recession. And so we are expecting this market to pull back and at least retest that 3577 level that we saw on the S&P in October and then sort of trend back up towards that 4,000 level by the time we get to the back half of the year, because we think by that time, the Fed is going to respond to a weaker economy, a weakening in the job market, and lower inflation. We're looking for inflation to come into that 3 to 4% range, and that's going to allow the Fed to cut. And we also think that those majority of the earnings cut will be behind us, and that will help to have a more sustainable rally in the market as we head into the back half of the year and back up to that 4,000 level. Nadia, who's buying right now? I think what you're seeing in terms of who's buying, you're seeing some systematic buying. You're also seeing a bit of a short covering happening in the market. I think that this rally um, wasn't uh, uh, expected to this magnitude that we're seeing. So you're seeing a bit of a short uh, covering happening. Traders are buying. But I think that once you get into 2023, it's really investors. And investors are somewhat still remain on the silent, anticipating a better entry point in the first half of the year. Where are they going to go, Nadia, especially given that we've already seen uh, bonds rally pretty tremendously. 
from a positioning standpoint, like we're positioned defensively within equities, just because we're expecting the bull, uh, a pullback in the market doesn't mean that there aren't things to do in the equity markets. I mean, look at some of the sectors that are up. The one sector that is up this year massively is energy. So if you were in energy, you made a lot of money. And we're also from a more uh, traditional defensive position, and we've been recommending consumer stables and healthcare. We think that those are the areas of the market that's going to be more resilient in this de- or these uh, downgrade cycles. And we're also focused on quality and value. Nadia, wonderful to get your view. Another bank looking for 4K year rent 23. Nadia Lovell of UBS so Global Wealth Management. Off, right? Look at so these numbers. Going to go through them point by point and I'll put them all out on Twitter before year rent. But here's a flavour of year rent 23. Bank of America, 4K. Okay, next one. Canter, 4100. I'll give you another one. City, 3900. Credit Suisse, 4050. All right, Goldman, 4K. HSBC, 4K. JP Morgan, 4,200. Jeffries, 4,200. See the theme here. RBC, 4,100. Morgan Stanley, 3,900. UBS, basically at 4K. Lisa, am I right that 99.28% of our guests have told me earnings are going to lowball? I think that's I think For that's Q1? huge consensus. In early 23, Lisa, I think pretty much everyone's on the same page. When did stocks stop being the discounting mechanism? When did they stop looking into the future? Frustrating me this now? is, isn't it? I'm on the same page with you. And then when you can't understand it, you blame the algos. This has basically <laughs> been what's been going on for the past couple of weeks. With respect. <laughs> you mean the last 10 years? Yeah. But with respect, <laughs> we, we aren't in the position of our good guests whose careers are on the line with these calls. I don't say this lightly. But my God, it's a one-way trade right now on weak earnings. The problem right now is that if inflation does roll over, people expect the Fed to go back to some sort of easy money policy, less restrictive, and move quickly. If that's the case, then they could see stocks go back to rallying, and then all of a sudden valuations make sense. Try to put this together. I think that the Bridgewater stuff shows just how difficult it is to be a macro investor right now and make any call that's going to move in tandem with algos. Just to dig deeper into the Bridgewater call. Because further along in Catherine Burden's story, it does point out that Bridgewater made most of the money this year by betting on rising interest rates, a stronger dollar and falling stocks. And what we've seen over the last couple of months is falling interest rates, a weaker dollar. So they stay in the trade, I guess. And rising stocks. We can imply that. We don't know. Based on what we've seen, you could perhaps read between the lines, of course. We haven't heard from Bridgewater because a representative from Bridgewater declined to comment on our story, Lisa. The, The speed in which we have seen the dollar weaken has been dramatic. The speed in which the moves have really come fast and furious, 70 basis point move in the 10 year in just, uh, mm. you know, six weeks, five weeks. This just highlights. This is stuff that really is the deepest, most liquid yeah. markets that's been stable for so long. The volatility whips on people, pushing them out of positions and causing some of the short covering and, people and are talking about. One of our interns holds a Dalio chair at Bloomberg Surveillance. Uh, Motors, Rebecca Patterson will join us on Monday. Schedule. Rebecca. Wait a sec. You're calling Patterson one of our interns? No, no he's no, talking no. about interns informed me that Patterson oh, was okay. going to be out there. Oh, right, okay. Just wanted to clean it's that up. It's a Dalio up. chair here at Bloomberg it's, Surveillance. Who's got the Dalio chair? One of our interns. They hold it every year. you seen year. Bob Prince's chair. Yeah. It's a nice chair. Yeah. It's a nice office. It's the entourage that's speaking to us from the corners that doesn't exist. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They're just his friends, Lisa. They're not as many. They're, um, they're a lot of work from home. <laughs> no, did you not have an imaginary Lisa. friend growing up? Lisa. I had a whole imaginary it, world. I think I'm in the, it still. The entourage, <laughs> The entourage is all work from home on Friday. (laughs) Payrolls, 20 minutes away. Monday through Thursday as well. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Jonathan just said it less than 20 minutes from now, we'll get the latest U.S. jobs report. Traders waiting to see if it provides any clues on the Federal Reserve's next move. The job market is starting to cool off, but the report may fall short of the turning point Fed officials are seeking in their battle to beat back inflation. The median estimate says the economy created 200,000 jobs in November. In South Africa, leaders of the country's ruling party are meeting today, while the fate of President Cyril Ramaphosa is up in the air. He's said to have considered resigning after an advisory panel found he may have violated the Constitution. South Africa's finance minister says it's not a done deal. It does not mean we've accepted that President Ramaphosa is leaving. I'm just saying in in the case of that happening, we will find ways of managing it, but I don't see it happening at the moment. There's no obvious successor to Ramaphosa within the ruling African National Congress.
The Pentagon is reportedly considering a major expansion in trading for Ukraine's armed forces. According to The Washington Post, the plan has been discussed for weeks by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and other top U.S. military officials. It could lead thousands of Ukrainian troops to be trained by U.S. forces at a base in Germany. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We have more confidence that this rally will continue. We think rates will go lower. Uh, we think, you know, Powell's commentary is right in line with what we've been saying, which is that they're going to pause probably uh, in January. And the market's getting in front of that. And this is a, this is a classic, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, kind of Fed pause stock market rally. Mike Wilson there of Morgan Stanley. I've got to say this call from Morgan Stanley. Listen carefully to that. Pause in January, Tom. Not step down. <laughs> Yeah. from 50 and go another 50. They're saying at the start of 2023, yeah. and Alan Zettner indicated that's where they're going, they think you get a pause that early in the year for, from this Fed. You want to do a watch here, folks, and I'll tease forward to John's effort at 9 o'clock. You want to listen to Mike Wilson yesterday from Morgan Stanley, and then you have Rick Reeder on. Am I right in the 9 yeah, o'clock hour? and Mohammed too. And Wilson and Reeder together on this market in the next six weeks. Forget about this. Naval gaze in out 12 months. I'm with, Bla I'm with Bridgewater. I mean, just getting out 90 days as they've struggled with is half Well, this battle. call Mike's made, never mind about the bearishness through <clears throat> 2022, the call to get bullish and get behind this bull market rally in the way huge. that he did in the last yeah. month. And it's continued yeah. through this week. I, I go back to revenue analysis, and, and I'm sorry, the nominal GDP number is good. And you know, granted, some people pushing against me on that. We're coming up on Jobs Day in 12 minutes. Let's get right to it. I'm going to do one question here to the former governor of the Federal Reserve System, Randall Crosner. He is at the University of Chicago. As Charles Evans steps aside at the Federal Reserve System of Chicago, and a surprise announcement for so many, but not to Randall Crosner, as his colleague, Austin Goolsby will join the Federal Reserve uh, team. Uh, Randy, I don't want to take a lot of time here. It's something you and I would do for one hour on Bloomberg on the economy. This is a guy who wrote the Intermediate Microeconomics Policy Bible with Steve Levitt of Freakonomics and others. This is a guy steeped in microeconomic foundations. What will Goolsby microeconomics mean? What will that voice mean to the Fed? I think... You can see from his comments uh, before getting out to the Fed that he's emphasized the, the supply side of the economy, really focused on that and said, well, maybe the Fed shouldn't be doing quite as much because it's really a supply issue and the Fed can't directly address that. We'll see if his, issue, his, uh, his views evolve, but he's really focused on the supply side of things. How do you really game out the supply side when China and the reopening is the big question mark for next year? Well, that's one of the challenges that uh, that he'll be having at, at the Fed. But that's, of course, one of the issues. Are we going to see a whole bunch of changes that will relax some of the supply side constraints? But also, at least from my perspective, you can't forget about the demand side because the price pressures come from where supply and demand come together. And obviously, the Fed does have an impact on uh, on the demand side. What are you seeing right now that perhaps the market is not in terms of the stickiness of inflation, of whether we have seen peak inflation, of just how quickly it can come down? So I think it's likely that inflation is, is going to be heading lower from, from here, but I'm not so sure it's going to come down so quickly, particularly for core inflation. One of the reasons for that, well, I think there are two reasons, uh, and Jay Powell mentioned both of them. One, you've got rents starting to move down, but the way rents come into the shelter services part of the um, uh, uh, part of the price indices, it's not just today's rents, but also over a number of months. So that's going to be somewhat slow to come down. The other part that's really relevant for today is he's worried about services. He's worried about uh, the strength of the labor market. And as I've been saying uh, with you for the last few months, the Fed's going to keep at it until they see the labor market crack. And I think uh, Jay really talked about that, said if the labor market continues to be hot, Wage 
uh, increases continue to be high, it's going to be very difficult for inflation to come down. And I yeah. think it is going to take a little while. So, Randy, did you see a real shift in tone, though, at the uh, at the Brooking Institute with Fed Chair Jay Powell, where perhaps he was less willing to stick with it, less willing to go all the way to five and hold it there? Oh, no, I didn't hear that at all. I, I think what he wanted to get out was that they're not going to do 75 basis points every single meeting forever. And uh, and I think it was pretty clear in the markets, I think, already had largely uh, accepted that they were probably going to do 50 at this, this meeting. And then we'll see how inflation evolves. I think they're going to continue into the mid fives. I think they will end and pause mm -hmm. with a five handle. But I don't think they're going to uh, stop um, at uh, in December and just hold it, you know, right uh, just below five or right around five. I think they'll probably go right. into the fives, and uh, that's probably where they'll hold it. And then I think they're going to hold it for a while because I don't think inflation is going to come down unless there's some sort of shock from Mr. Putin or from some other right. geopolitical. Randy, I want you to speak to Global Wall Street on this jobs day, seven minutes away. I want you to do some brown mathematics, some brown algebra. And there's a Greek letter on the left, the right side of the equation, which is called epsilon, which is this massive uncertainty that's out there in every Krosner-like study. Have you ever seen uncertainty like this? Yeah, and I think the way it's manifest is you see incredibly strong movements in the markets from just small changes in information. So, you know, a, a couple of weeks back when we got uh, a slightly better uh, inflation report, markets took off like a rocket. Now, that's one data point. It was just slightly different than had been expected. I think that shows that the, the markets are, are really quite skittish, and uh, they jump a lot when there's just a little bit of information getting at that epsilon, a lot of uncertainty. Randy, you're going to stick with us and break down these numbers when they come out in about seven minutes' time. I've got eyes on Mike McKee, which usually means something big's about to happen, Tom. Mike McKee's in the studio. <laughs> we hey, hope Mike, so. <laughs> great to have you with us. Let's go through these numbers together. 200K yeah. is the median estimate in our survey. How big's the range? What are you looking for? The range isn't very wide this time, and there's a general concentration around 200,000, but uh, maybe in the, it skews a little bit to the downside, and the whisper number on Wall Street, according to the function on the Bloomberg, is uh, 188. So maybe the folks who've raised the idea of what do we do if it's too small? You were talking about that uh, earlier, uh, Tom. Uh, that, that'll be the question for Wall Street to answer. What about wages? That's going to be the, the big issue. And Jay Powell made it that way on Wednesday because he said service industries at this point <clears throat> are the ones that are still having to pay up. So we're going to watch and see who uh, whether service industry wages are still rising significantly and then the impact on the overall average hourly earnings. We've seen savings come down dramatically, but we see spending continue to surprise to the upside. When you speak to economists, when you speak with Fed members, are they surprised by how quickly people are getting ahead of this disinflation, softer labor market type of story? Yeah, I mean, the old theory is that inflation's bad because uh, people will spend money today, you know, before it becomes worth less uh, in the future. Uh, I don't think consumers think like that. They're not saying, well, this is going to cost a lot more, so I'm going to go out and buy a dress today. Uh, but it might, maybe with a car or a house. But at this point, uh, there, there was a big cash cushion that people had coming out of the pandemic. They're spending down out of that. We're seeing credit card usage start to rise. It's still not where it used to be, but people are spending more on credit. And it kind of shows you the will of the American people is to hang in there. <laughs> you know, hey, the don't resilience. stand between an American and a cash register, as they <laughs> yeah, say. The Retail say sales were up 7 or 8 percent. The Thanksgiving, Cyber Black, and all the rest of it. Interview of the week so far. Neil Dutta, Renmac, without a doubt. I agree. I Sat agree with Mike's that. Chair, That's the first the time you and I have agreed. Of the U.S. In, economy. Like, it's our anniversary. It's our so, anniversary. You know, we've we been, we're going through couples therapy, Mike. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's very emotional. Uh, I'm, sure that, we're, we're, I'm sure Lisa doesn't try. Do you say, accept insurance for this couples therapy? We're very <laughs> you vulnerable. think I'm therapist? <laughs> you think no, I'm going to go watch the World Cup. <laughs> uh, our co-pay is about $25 each. Ramo charges. What, what's the alley right now? $350. <laughs> $350 <laughs> to sit with us for an hour. Oh, it's probably <laughs> you, you should demand more than that. <laughs> Payroll is coming up. It's five minutes away. Your Inflation. estimate is 200 Did we break, like three HR rules there? <laughs> <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Rolls Friday on Bloomberg Surveillance. The data seconds away. Going into it, equity futures negative two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Yields lower at the front end by three or four basis points. With your economic data, here's Mike McKee. 
Well, the whisper number was wrong, John. <laughs> we got 263,000 jobs created in the month of November, so a significant beat to the upside. Even the forecast was 200,000. And that puts us uh, <laughs> at this point ahead of, I'm, I'm just looking here uh, for what the revised uh, monthly October number was, but uh, it was 261. And um, the change for October was revised up by 23,000 from 261 to 284. So, yeah, uh, job growth slowed, but it was a lot faster back in October than we thought. Uh, the unemployment rate is holding steady at 3.7%. That's what everybody cares about. Uh, that 100,000 job loss in manufacturing in the ADP report does not translate. 14,000 jobs created in manufacturing. Earnings, this is the one, Lisa, that I've been looking at, up six-tenths. Uh, that is stronger than anticipated, stronger than the five-tenths in October. And that pushes up average hourly earnings year over year to 5.1%. 5.6% 5 uh, 5 is actually the revised number for October, so it's a decline, but it's uh, significantly higher than it was in the initial report. I'll give you the labor force participation rate. It drops to 62.1%. Jay Powell said kind of... That is not something they're as worried about as they were in the past. But I'll bet you, John, that uh, wages number has got Wall Street's attention. Oh, Mike, this one's easy to interpret, isn't it? Equities down, lower, negative by 1.4 percent, negative 1.5. If you want to round this one down on the S&P 500, future softer, yields higher, much higher. By about 10 basis points at the front end on a two-year, back to 432. <coughs> on a 10-year, up nine basis points to just south of 360. And as you can imagine, with equities down and yields up, the dollar stronger. Dollar index, Tom, up by half of 1%. Upside surprise on payrolls. Oh. Upside surprise on wages. Equities down. What a great day to have Jeff Rosenberg with us and Governor Krosner with us. And Mike, I know, is diving the data. I got two quick comments. My quick calculation of the 90-day, three-month moving average, including revisions. Don't hold me to this, folks, but I believe the statistic is 280,000. And the others, can we have a moment of silence for Ben Emmons, who sure. nailed this an hour and a half ago? So let's get some perspective. 433 on a two-year. That is about 50 basis points lower than we were in the immediate aftermath of the last payrolls report. So, Mike McKee, can you walk us through how the Federal Reserve conversation has reset over the last month and what you think these numbers might mean on December 14th for the next decision? Well, uh, it, it kind of fits the narrative that uh, we're still seeing a strong economy, so the Fed has to do more. The question is, how high do they have to go? And that was the emphasis that Powell put on it. If we don't see wages start to come down, then we're going to have to keep going up until they do. They need to be in the 3 to 3.5% range in order to be compatible with a 2% inflation rate. So at this point, wages are still a problem the Fed has to address. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to go 75 basis points. I don't think this that changes this calculation at all. But it does probably move uh, Fed funds futures out into 2023 with a little bit uh, more of an increase priced in until we see some sort of change here. Why was the whisper number so wrong? Why are people so confident that there is going to be some massive deceleration that just keeps not coming? Well, you don't know exactly what people on Wall Street are thinking, but we did have the poor ADP report, and we had the ISM manufacturing report come in uh, showing there's still contraction in payrolls, and there's generally been a... Uh, a, a lot of news about layoffs and planned job cuts, mostly in tech, but uh, certainly we've seen over the last week, the news media. Uh, so uh, probably that all got absorbed into people's thinking about what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. We've been cautioned by a lot of CEOs that things are not as bad as they seem out there. And also remember how hard it's been to hire people. And so they don't want to let people I, go. My yet. head's spinning here. John, what's the market statistics that got your attention? Yields up at the front end by 14 basis points. Yeah. And, trying and, to get and back advancing, to the levels where, advancing. Trying to get back to the levels where Chairman Powell spoke earlier this week. Because Chairman Powell yeah. took a lot of weight out of the front end of the curve a little bit earlier this week, Tom. And for the curve and vision, we're watching to negative 76 basis points. Real yield up, but we'll go through that in a moment. The guests are too important right now. Randa Krosner with us, Professor Krosner of the Booth School, uh, Chicago as well. Randa, you and I can talk about the algebra of standard error. Forget about it. Do we have any understanding of the veracity of our statistics given the new America, the new technology out there? Are we making this up as we go, or can we really guesstimate forward with some good faith? 
I think we have uh, reasonable um, uh, reasonable insight into that. But of course, as you said, there are a lot of changes. Things are new. We're bouncing out of uh, a very unusual period with uh, COVID shutdowns. So of course, there's uncertainty that that's there. But I think as we were talking about before, and as I'd, I'd said before, the Fed is going to keep at it until the labor market cracks. The labor market has not cracked. Wages are still going up uh, at a very rapid clip. And uh, the Fed can't stop until the labor market starts to slow down, because otherwise um, you're going to see wage inflation continue strong. You're going to see uh, services um, uh, services prices continue to go up. And so they're going to keep at it. And as I said, I think they're going to keep at it till they get at least until the mid uh, mid fives in um, uh, in the next year. And uh, Jay is hoping, and he, he talked about this, what, what I call a an, an immaculate disinflation. That is, could we bring the inflation rate down without having a significant rise in the unemployment rate? The only way they can do that is if wages start to come down, if more people come into the labor market, if demand starts to come down. We haven't seen that yet. So it doesn't look like an immaculate disinflation. Interest rates are going to have to continue to rise. Fed Chair Jay Powell pointing to accelerated or brought forward retirements as a big driver of why we are not seeing the participation rate go back, why people are not coming back into the labor market. What did you make of his comments around that, that this week? Well, I think you know that was his hope that maybe if, if there's more supply coming into the labor market, that'll help to take some of the heat out of uh, out of wages. Well, we're not seeing a lot of evidence of that now, and he was sort of hinting at, I was hoping for that. Don't really seem to see it. So the only way that we can do this is to have um, slow down in demand that'll slow down the uh, demand for workers and slow down those uh, those wage increases. He's still hoping, uh, but we've never had an immaculate disinflation before. I don't want to say it's impossible, but uh, but it's uh, I think it's not very likely. Randy Crosner with us, of course, of the Booth School of Chicago in moments. Jeffrey Rosenberg will join us as well from BlackRock. We welcome all of you on radio and television of the shock of this jobs day. Futures in negative 61, as John Farrell mentions, two-year yield exploding out. John, and a cup of coffee, a, a sip of tang, we've gone from 14 basis points out to 17 basis points, higher two-year yield. Back to 440. Still yeah. below the highs of the week, but back to 440. <clears throat> and with the yields up at the front end, Tom, as you can imagine, equities down, futures lower by one5 Five percent on the S and P and the dollar stronger by about seven tenths of one percent on DXY. To see this, folks, we're all wired in, but none of us is wired in like Michael McKee. He is looking there at the BLS data. I'm looking over just because I can attest. I'm going like this. <laughs> oh, trying, trying to see what I'm looking at. What do you? What is the single data you see in the pages? That you go through. Well, I'm just trying to do the math here. The interesting thing about the hiring here is you, you might not be surprised that there were 20,000 construction jobs added. Uh, we've got a lot of rebuilding to do down in Florida. But what month is it? It's November, and we lost jobs in retailing, 30,000 jobs lost in retailing. That just seems very odd uh, to me that uh, we don't have as many people uh, doing the retail work at, at, at holiday Is that time. Amazon, um, the cuts there by Mr. Josie? It, it, it could be. Uh, I can go back and look here. One of the things you want to look at is the uh, – um, in, in, under transportation, warehousing, and uh, and and couriers, and uh, that uh, couriers and warehousing were down uh, <laughs> twelve point four uh, thousand. Uh, so at, at this point, it's kind of hard to see. Amazon made a lot of hires in that world, <laughs> but in the last couple of years, yeah, I mean, but they don't seem to have added. A lot of people, and that's kind of kind of a little strange. You have to dig into that a little bit further. We'll do that in about twenty minutes' time. Mike McKee's going to break down the jobs numbers for us as we go towards the opening bell. Then we're going to hear from this lineup, fantastic lineup going into the open: Mohammed Al Erin of Bloomberg Opinion, and a whole lot more, and Rick Reader of BlackRock. Then we'll hear from Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, Mike Collins of PGM, and you'll hear from Secretary Welch. Tom responded to these numbers yeah. at about 9.45 Eastern time. Maybe our most important conversation with the Secretary of Labor, given the railroad uh, theatrics of America, harkening back to 1946 and 1877. Uh, thank you so much, Randall Crosner, for being with us today. And now we bring in, uh, really at a telling point, given bond market movement, Jeffrey Rosenberg uh, joins us now from BlackRock. Jeff Rosenberg, I look at the volatility, and I don't want to equate it over to the news on Bridgewater and their challenging fourth quarter quarter. How do you run fixed income money right now? I don't have a clue. 
Well, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges is what we're seeing in the in the reaction to this uh, surprise to the up upside, and, and particularly as you guys have highlighted, it's the wage data that that's driving it. But what you see is stocks are down, and bond yields are up, and and that's the kind of uh, correlation, a, a, a positive correlation. Uh, in in terms of uh, both going down at the same time, that is that is so challenging for right. investors. And I think it's a reminder. You know what we learned from uh, Chair Powell in the speech earlier this week is that the most important determinant for inflation going forward is going to be the services component. And what drives that services component is wages. And so what we might be starting to, to get a hint of here, and it was in a little bit of the earlier conversation, yeah, yeah, wages, uh, not wages, sorry, uh, inflation's coming down uh, because of all those underlying components, the supply side, the goods picture, the discussion around the lagged impact of housing. None of that matters. What matters is a wage price spiral. And so this upside uh, surprise really? You're here. You're going to bring that out today, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what matters is is this is this wage price uh, and, and what we're seeing in the wages, and so I think that's the most important takeaway. And the challenge, to get back to your question, yeah. uh, is that inflation really undermines uh, the, the 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 relationship uh, between stock bond uh, correlation. We can't get back to yeah. that until we settle this. I busted Jeff Rosenberg's chops. This is what happens when you study with Meltzer and good friend at Carnegie Mellon. You start talking about a wage spice, spice he, he spiral. He has a point, though, Tom. Let me Please. just jump in here quickly and tell you. I did the calculations. Private service industry jobs, wages were up eight tenths of a percent, while goods producing jobs were up four tenths. So what Jay Powell said about service industry jobs driving wages higher because they can't find employees uh, is definitely showing up in, in the wage data, it appears. Which composition really raises a question as well. And Randy Krasner, I'd love you weighing in on that, whether there's a compositional aspect where people on the higher ends are getting hired and there's a shortage, especially with the retirees. And on the lower ends, perhaps it's a different picture. What's your sense of how much that's contributing to the unexpectedly high rise in wage inflation? Jeff Rosenberg, what's your sense of that? Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I thought Randy uh, might have been might have been off, but I'll take that. Uh, yeah, you always have to look at the compositional uh, effects here, and, and certainly uh, there may be some of that, as as Mike highlighted with the with the retail numbers down and the warehouse numbers down, and and Mike, some of that can be seasonal, so that's something we'll we'll have to look in. So there is definitely when you look at the high frequency data on a month to month basis. You can get a mixed shift, and that may be pushing up this number, this 0.55 mm -hmm. number. Nevertheless, you know, the bigger takeaway, if you abstract, if you smooth out from the monthly variations, is that the 12-month run rate, a run rate of uh, wage inflation is still above 5%. Right. And so this is really the challenge. And so we're going to get away at some point from this debate about 50 or 75 or really the pace. And the issue is, is the level of rates restrictive enough? That's really going to be the debate, because right now on the bond curve, the market is expecting rates to be cut by the second half of 2023. So there's a real disconnect between an expectation that we can see the Fed have success on inflation, so much so that they can turn and start cutting rates, versus what we're seeing in the data today, which is right. none of the impact. Now, there's long and variable lags here, so that's going to make it challenging. But the reality is, and that's what you're seeing in the reaction in the front end of the curve, is that we still have a significant inflation problem in the most important driver of inflation, right. which is in wages and services. But Jeff, I got eight ways to go here, and I'm going to do this, and in, in particularly with your heritage at, at Tepper and, and Carnegie Mellon. And the bottom line is we've been here before. There's a belief out there by a lot of people that our financial world and maybe even our social world is going to fall apart with higher real rates, higher nominal rates, et cetera. That we've lived this before. We've been here before. What do you presume will we, will we look like financially with a 5% Fed rate? 
Well, we're seeing that right now in terms of some of the, the, the implications of a withdrawal of liquidity, which you've seen in, in, in the tech sector, which you're seeing in terms of some of the early stage venture and, and the impacts that has had and seen from a withdrawal of liquidity. And certainly in my markets, in the bond markets, the repricing from zero to a positive real interest rate or a, certainly a positive nominal interest rate with inflation staying sticky, it's hard to see the positive real interest rate, you know, is significant negative returns in fixed income. Now, the good news going forward is that adjustment from zero to the 400 basis point increases that we've seen this year is a one-time effect. And so the negative returns in fixed income are hard to repeat a second year going because you start with a lot, lot higher income. So one of the positive aspects here, uh, away from the significant challenges everywhere else in financial markets, is that cash has a yield associated with it. Whether that's a real yield after inflation depends on the outlook for inflation, but certainly there's a much better opportunity set in cash in the front end of the yield curve. And that helps to give a little bit of a place to hide while we see a lot of the implications of your question, a much yeah. higher nominal interest rate across financial markets uh, play out as they as it continues to play out. Jeff, I'm just looking at market movements here and just the whipsaw that we've seen in the benchmark instruments like rates, like two-year yields up now 14 basis points. Now suddenly people gaming back out that 5% peak Fed funds rate. If we haven't seen a liquidity crisis yet, if we haven't seen a financial system accident, what's going to trigger it given that we have seen such incredible volatility on the backs of some of these numbers? Yeah, you know, we, we've seen sort of a, a, a rolling sequencing of kind of smaller fires. Uh, it's sort of like the analogy, uh, small fires, small fires, small forest fires prevent large forest fires. Uh, so I think some of that is helping to ease some of the broader concerns. I think the other thing is that there's an anchoring to the global financial crisis as sort of the metric of what, what does a liquidity crisis look like? And that was a, a very particular one. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of things to mitigate that type of event from happening again. So the centerpiece of a liquidity crisis doesn't necessarily flow through the regulated financial markets. What we saw in the UK with the LDI crisis earlier this year, earlier this fall, is exactly this, this point. Um, so you have seen some of those implications and, and you know, I think we'll continue to, to, to right. see these kind of smaller forest fires as opposed to the, 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 the big fires. Uh, Jeff like Rosenberg, the, thank uh, you so well. much at BlackRock. Really, really appreciate it. Just a really exceptionally interesting and nuanced report to summarize not only the job statistic, better than good, better job formation, but the revision the same way uh, as well. Futures deteriorate, negative 65. Dow futures, negative 433. Uh, the VIX, I don't have a good VIX number right now. Oil doesn't give me much, but the bond market was up 17 basis points on the two-year yield, a higher yield. We're now up 14 basis points. Uh, as well. I want to get Mike McKee in here before we go on bonds to Ira Jersey and Gina Martin Adams on the equity. Uh, market. What do you see on page 47 of the report? <laughs> well, we didn't even talk about uh, the factors behind the unemployment rate, which are kind of a little weird here. A household survey can be very volatile, and it shows 138,000 jobs lost uh, uh, in, in terms of the number of employed, and the unemployment uh, number of people who were unemployed went down by 48,000. So it there were fewer unemployed, but but more who mm -hmm. were not employed, and uh, the the uh, the labor force fell by 186 thousand. And this is the time of year when you would expect the labor force to have increased, even with seasonal adjustment <clears throat> factors. And this is again because of retail. Because of retail, no, uh, we no. do have one of our. Uh, most loyal viewers has written in and suggested that uh, it could be that employers have been hoarding workers so they didn't need to hire as many seasonal workers or it could be and i'm going to be very interested people who follow this stuff really down to the minute level Unlike i'll be you, interested yeah, to see uh, goldman had a thing on on uh, jobless claims the other day suggesting that claims are overstated because they changed the way they did seasonal adjustment right, for right, the pandemic right. and i wonder if that may be affecting holiday hiring here because the, the numbers <clears throat> yeah. during the pandemic didn't compare to previous. Michael McKee will continue this discussion with us through the next hour as well. Again, futures negative 62. On the buying market, Ira Jersey joins us. He is with Bloomberg Intelligence driving forward our U.S. interest rate strategy. 
Ira Jersey, how does Chairman Powell's world change with the shock report? Well, well I, I think that uh, the Fed has to be, you know, less balanced. So over the last couple of months, the Federal Reserve has become more balanced in that, yes, it's still talking very hawkishly, but it's also saying like, hey, we don't want to go too far. You know, the Chair Powell said that just a couple of days ago. And I think uh, with a report like this, you have to be very concerned that you are going to get, uh, you know, Jeff Rosenberg's wage price spiral, right? And and because of that, um, maybe you only go 50 basis points in December. And I think that that's still the base case, but the market now is starting to price. And I think that this is right, that maybe the Fed is going to have to go 50 again in February. And because you, you wind up with a, a uh, still a, a faster than expected rate of increase in the Fed funds rate. That means you're going to get just more yeah. flattening of the yield curve, additional inversion, <laughs> and uh, and pricing right. for a harder landing, quite frankly. Lisa, how can you have a wage price spiral if after adjustment for inflation, everybody's paycheck is getting smaller every week, every month? That's the it reason doesn't make why. Sense. But this is the reason why people are going to their employers <clears throat> and saying, look, we need to get paid more or we're going to do early retirement or we're going to basically bow out of the market and take care of our kids. There are structural issues here, Ira, that are leading to the participation rate going lower and wages going higher. You said that the market is starting to game out 50 basis points in February, too. Is it? Because it, right now the market feels all over the place with just one weaker than expected print on the CPI suddenly shifting everyone back to four and a half percent peak funds rate. Well, it, well, th I can tell you right now the market is pricing for now a 50-50 shot of a, a 50 basis point hike in February. So that was almost zero at the beginning b before this data. So, um, so that is what the market's pricing. I, I would say one of the things that's interesting is that even though you've had such a strong report, when you look at things like overnight index swaps or the Fed funds futures curve, uh, we haven't gotten back to where we were a month ago, right? So we're still not pricing for a five, five and a quarter percent terminal rate by the Fed. And I think that ultimately over time, if, if the you have some other data that kind of concurs with this uh, with this payrolls report, um, that we wind up probably getting back there at some point. Because I, I yeah. do think that the Fed is going to hike to above 5%, which means that two-year yields are probably still 30 or 40 basis points too low. Tom mentioned that we've, we've rallied about 50 basis points on the two-year yield. We're going to undo most of that, I think, if the data continues to be as strong as, as this uh, today's morning's report uh, I did, suggests. I I take your point, Ira, and it does seem as though this uh, data set was of particular importance. Jason Furman of Harvard University, formerly uh, one of the economic advisors to former President Obama, put this tweet out <clears throat> just moments ago on Twitter. You probably want to revise your views on inflation and its overall dynamic more based on today's jobs report than any other data report this entire year and not in a favorable direction. Ira, is there this sense that this jobs report changes the scenario for you and changes the scenario for others? Well, like everything, we have to say this is one report, but it is a, uh, it, I think it is pretty meaningful because when you look at some of the other data, like you look at the ISM manufacturing employment numbers being negative, um, we do need confirmation of this, right? So so let's not get, I, I wouldn't get as overly excited as that tweet suggests, but at the same time, we'd have to look out and, and I think the risks are rising <laughs> that if, right. uh, if we do continue to have very strong uh, payrolls and, and wage gains, that, uh, that the Fed is maybe even have to go beyond the five and a quarter that Bloomberg Economics thinks that we're going to have to go. And and that can have, right. again, very significant implications for the rates markets. Uh, Ira Jersey, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. We're going to continue here. Gina Martin Adams with us here in a moment uh, on uh, Bloomberg Intelligence equities in the stock market and a wonderful new index. Mike McKee, off of Rosenberg's comment on wage spiral, I did a moving average study of average hourly earnings back to the nadir of 2012-ish. Wages are up 154% year over year from a very low level of about 2% wage growth, and we've ballooned up to 5.1%. In the literature, is that a spiral? I suppose you could count it as, as a spiral, but uh, from 2012 to 2020, wage growth was very, very slow. So you, what you're really getting is the last couple of years are pushing that number up. And I think uh, the Fed knew that was going to happen, knows that's going to happen, and that's what they're, they're pushing back against right now and saying they're going to have to, as uh, Ira was saying, raise rates maybe farther 
to bring well, down the the <clears throat> wage gains. Um, I think what right. what is most important to Americans is if you did the calculation for what CPI has done since that time period and measured what they got to pay because everybody's falling behind. The best. Michael McKee, thank you so much. On to John Farrow and uh, also what we do on radio here in the next hour. Gina Martin-Adams saves the day. Uh, she knew the triple leverage all cash fund was the right equity position here off the secretary report. Uh, Gina, congratulations on the splash of the Bloomberg Intelligence MVP portfolio. This is really, really cool. How will the MVP portfolio do in a buoyant American labor economy? It generally should be pretty well positioned, considering that value is one of the key factors of the MVP portfolio. Recall, we combine momentum, value, low volatility, and high profitability companies to come up with our list of 50 stocks within the S&P 500 that are pretty well positioned on a risk-return basis to perform well. And the portfolio has performed well throughout various types of, of economic climates. But considering that value is one of those key factors, Value stocks tend to perform best in periods in which inflation is accelerating. So steady inflation signaled by the wage, wages component of the employment report uh, from this morning would generally suggest value should perform reasonably well. That said, this, is por this portfolio is generally designed to help identify stocks that perform best throughout time and in various climates. Gina, we've been talking all morning about how everybody right now is bearish on stocks in the first quarter, but still bullish right now. Today, we're seeing perhaps a bit of a shift in tone. What do you make of this in terms of who's out there buying now versus all of the people who are giving recommendations against that exact trade come early next year? Yeah, I'm frankly not quite sure what to make of it, Lisa. I think a lot of it is about market timing. And certainly you have a bunch of cross currents with people thinking about, you know, what's going to happen over the next month versus over the next year at year end, which creates a lot of confusion and commentary and, and interpretation of narrative. Uh, you know, our view is, look, stocks do look a little bit vulnerable to correction going into year, uh, year end, if for no other reason than just tax loss harvesting. What you tend to see is fairly muted muted returns toward uh, the calendar year turn after an environment in which stocks have struggled throughout the year. And that certainly has, has characterized 2022. Also, small caps have lost a little bit of momentum here, which would hint to, the, to us that we're due for a bit of a pullback in large caps. And this is all information we, we published yesterday in our chart book report. Uh, so I, I do think we're poised for a little bit of a pullback here into year end. And then into 2023, it really, once again, is all about the fundamentals of will the Fed actually get to a point where they feel satisfied with the disinflation that is likely to occur? And can they eventually pivot yeah. versus well, we're in an earnings recession. And the market is really struggling with this right now because the market keeps d just desperately sort of clinging to that notion that the Fed can pivot. And none of the data would suggest the Fed is likely to well, pivot anytime soon. On so the we're flip going to be in this sort of volatile climate for a while. Gina, just quickly here, on the flip side, could people say perhaps earnings are going to be better than people are currently <laughs> saying in the first quarter because we are seeing those hirings, because we are seeing those wages being paid, and that earnings are not going to come down as much as some people are suggesting? Yeah. Doubtful, Lisa, because employment is not really one of the best drivers of earnings growth over time. I think employment certainly is a key factor for the Fed to watch, certainly is a key factor defining economic conditions broadly. But when we look at the factors that really drive earnings growth for the S&P 500, single most important factor is durable goods orders. Secondly, you've got commodity prices. Thirdly, you look at the long-term trend in the unemployment rate. We're not getting improvement in the employment, unemployment rate anymore. We're also not getting deterioration. But the fact that you're not seeing improvement in the unemployment right. rate is actually on net, not a positive for earnings growth. So you want to watch those other factors as more important macro factors that drive earnings. But frankly, right. the macro is not the whole story either. This is really about margins. Gina. And will companies be able to cost cut into a better environment next year. Gina, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll speak next week as well. Gina Martin-Adams with us with Bloomberg Intelligence Equity uh, Operations as well. Lisa, on the survey screen, 270 was a high estimate. What an odd report. And, the you know, Ben Emmons with his note an hour and a half before the report, I thought was shockingly prescient in terms of the mathematics that gets you to a high estimate. Stephen Gallagher at Society General, David Kelly at J.P. Morgan absolutely nailed this. Ian Shepherdson, when he wasn't watching Newcastle football, nailed it. And uh, you know, I, and there's others as well. But 
it, it's just, you know, did we know that we would come in and swing like this from the whisper? <laughs> Clearly the not, whisper? based on what the market's doing. But it's not just that. It's also I'm the so revisions. Rich. Everything went up, including in wages. That's yeah. really what stands out to me. A quiescent market off the shock. We were futures negative 60, negative 70. Now S&P futures at negative 55 as well. An eventful Friday. Stay with us on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Good morning.